Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for our fourth annual Profitability Masterclass with Chris Rosnowski. Thanks, Brooke. <clears throat> welcome, everyone. We're going to go through this, and it's a little different this year. Um, you know, if you look at the market, the headwinds have changed. We've got uh, a lot of stuff coming towards us. Interest rates have gone up. Uh, it's getting a little tighter in the work markets. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to go through profitability analysis and, and what's driving your business, uh, how the uh, factors in the industry are affecting profitability. And then we're going to talk about real strategies that you can use that I use in my business to reduce costs, increase chargeouts. Um, then we're going to be looking at making up in volume and how volume is an amplifier and how it can affect your, your business. Uh, how do you scale, right? What's the proper way to get into scaling your business? And then if it's okay with you guys at the end, um, we have a couple tools that actually deliver some of the big measurables that we talk about here. So I'm going to briefly, I'm going to spend two minutes uh, just introducing introducing you to those, uh, not a sales pitch, just letting you know what it's doing. And then we'll get into the question and answer period at the end. Uh, that's going to be our day. Now, during the session, uh, we don't have breakouts for questions this year. What we're going to do is Brooke's going to uh, be monitoring the questions. We'll save a bunch of them for the end. Uh, she'll come in and, and uh, interrupt the presentation from time to time with questions that are relevant. And then we'll spend all that time at the end going through this with you guys. Now, we know that you're there to help customers. So when we talk about the restoration industry, it's kind of the same person company to company, you might be a franchise, you might be a corporate, but you're doing big things to help customers. And if you if your goal wasn't to help customers, you wouldn't get up at two in the morning to go help somebody. You wouldn't go a thousand miles to, to help someone in a cat. Um, but we sometimes do that at, the, at the, the harm of our own business. We sacrifice the business decisions in order to meet the technical compliance from the IICRC. So technically we should respond quickly, Business-wise, it's not always the right thing. And then how we run our businesses is, is that it's driven on helping people. So if your business is, is almost like a firefighter or a paramedic, your first response is to help someone. Your second response is to figure out the dollars after. And that's where we get ourselves into trouble because we're actually in business to help our staff achieve their goals. Uh, we're trying to achieve financial goals for the company. And personally, if you're an owner or, or senior manager within a business, and as a lead technician, your job is, or your goal is maybe to better your career. And then you walked into restoration, maybe you didn't know what it was about, but you're working in towards helping people and then build a career out of it. It shouldn't feel like you're being taken advantage of and it shouldn't feel like your business is under all this scrutiny and pressure. Now, when we look at it, it's getting harder to compete. So every day it's harder and harder because there's differences in the market. Our relationships with the adjusters has gone away where we don't have that one-to-one that -one with the person writing the check anymore. Uh, we've got TPAs that provide a uh, stopgap between the adjuster and, and the check. Uh, we've got consultants and reviewers, and all of them are creating this barrier to the person that uh, makes the claims decision, the person that's licensed to make the, make the claims decision. And it makes it harder for our businesses to become profitable. So we're looking at systems that help you work better. Um, they're helping you to achieve more money, more more profitability. And inside those systems, you're maybe in preferred networks or outside of preferred networks, and you need to find ways to make that work. Now, your business can feel like it's bleeding cash. When you get into that stage or that mentality, and I've been there as a business owner. So when your business feels like everything that you're doing is good for the customer, good for your staff, but the cash just keeps going out the company and you're not turning a profit or you're losing money, um, you're paying staff, you're paying rent, you're paying trades. That pressure on the business can uh, make you do some things that you wouldn't normally do, right? Anytime you get into financial pressure, you're going to make decisions that are either good for the business or bad for the business. Sometimes they're instant decisions that you have to make today. Sometimes they're thought out and they're strategic. And that's what I want you to shift your mind to is that when we're losing cash or we're spending our dollars, are we doing it in a way that is effective for our business. Um, big efforts, you know, going a thousand miles, getting up early should lead to big profits. Uh, the effort should substantiate the work that we're doing. And the lack of effort isn't our problem in the restoration industry. We put a lot of effort into helping people. It's not always rewarded. And so we have to do a lot of stuff on the back end of our businesses to make sure we're rewarded for that hard effort. Now, 
I can tell you the last year we had a lot of people that when we did the poll said they were losing money or they were barely making a profit. Uh, so you're not alone. When you go to trade shows, we talk to restorers that are saying, hey, we're struggling. Uh, I have a lot of one-on-ones with restorers that uh, confide in, in how their business is doing. And this year, it's a tougher year than it has been in years past. That's what we're hearing from restorers right now. Um, but when you focus on profitability and you get those numbers into an area where you're substantiating your business, your business is sustainable, you're actually able to drive your business into a, a, a better decision-making tree. And really what you're doing is enforcing good behaviors within the business. And if we can get that down to the technician level, then you're enforcing good behaviors all the way through uh, the decision tree in your business. We're going to talk about this um, here in profit because as, a, as an industry, we always talk about doing the right thing. Doing the right thing means you do the right thing for your customer. It means you do the right thing for your staff. It also means you do the right thing for the business. And for the business, it means that you need to generate profit. If you want to grow your business, you need profit. If you want to sustain your business, you need profit. And if you want to get through those droughts, we need to generate profit. So this is our focus here. Um, profit allows you to hire better staff. It allows you to hire better trades. It allows you to weather uh, those, those droughts that we go through. All of that is improving your business and allowing you to capitalize on opportunities in the market. And when you're in this time, like if 2024 turns into a financial nightmare for uh, the economy, if you're profitable, you're going to be able to take advantage of that and grow your business. So here's the three things that we're going to focus on that would kill your business. Cost kill profits. Um, when we look at it, the, the owners typically look at costs as the opportunity to be paying money for things that are, are costing your business some dollars. But when you look at costs, there's good costs and bad costs, right? There's costs that are investments in your business. And then there's costs that we just waste money. We overspend money. So we're going to look at that. We're going to talk about increasing chargeouts because that's where profit is generated. It's from increasing your chargeouts within the confines of the systems that you're using. If you're in programs, then you have a set of rules that are being placed on you. If you're outside of programs, you have some opportunities to to do some things that are a little different. And then we'll talk about how do people look at making it up on volume because what we're really doing is looking at volume as an amplifier. It's gonna show what you're doing really well and it's gonna just uh, create the results that you're not doing well. And what happens is, and, and what we'll get into, is it as you grow your business or as you're in the middle of a growth stage, volume can actually be the reason that you close your doors. If you get caught in the middle of a growth stage, uh, that could be the area that you fail. So you had a really good business last year. This year you decided to grow and you invested in it. And part of that volume play will, will suck the life out of your business. And we'll get into that um, a little bit into the slides. Now, we're going to do these polls. And we do this every year. So this session is based on what you give us for information. Now, the polls are anonymous. No one will see your answer. So be honest and, and give us your answer. If you don't want to participate, that's fine. Just don't throw fake answers in there because what we're going to do is we're going to take the poll questions and then uh, tailor the talk to what the polls are saying. We did this last year and the year before and it worked really well. So we're going to start with our first poll, which is what is your uh, annual revenue of your company? And in here, you have a few choices, zero to one million, one to three, three to six, six to 10 or 10 or more. And What's interesting, I've been, I've been privileged enough to work in small companies, zero to one. Um, I owned a zero to one. I owned a one to three. I ran a six to 10, and I got to run a uh, 38 to $42 million uh, district. So uh, I've worked in the different size companies. And what's interesting is that these rules apply, whether you're a small startup or you've been in the business and you built a, a pretty uh, large business altogether. I'm going to see if I can see these uh, uh, poll questions. See if we can see the results. So we got, and this is actually really good. We got a, a third of you are, are zero to one. Uh, a third of you are one to three. Three to six is 20% of you. And then we have a few that are six to eight and 15% are 10 or more. So uh, on average, we're going to be sitting around that $3 million mark. Uh, and we're going to use that for our next, uh, our, when we get into the profitability cal calculator there. Um, the next question we have for you is, what is your, uh, how profitable are you? And 
in here, this poll is basically how much margin are you netting out? What, what's your net margin, your net profitability? If you don't know, that's fine. Uh, don't just fake it. Uh, but what we're looking for is the real answer because we're going to take this conversation and put it into our profitability calculator. I'll show you how this works. Um, we're 3 million here. And what happens is I thought I was the only one that lost money. In 2014, my partner died. Um, our business was suffering. He was sick and then he passed away and, and uh, our business went through a major transition. And I thought we were the only company in the industry that lost money and I felt horrible about it until I was at a conference and I talked to uh, Jacqueline Carpenter. I said, actually, I had the worst year I think ever. She said, I had the worst year. She goes, you know, we all come to these conferences and we tell each other about how many trucks we have and how many people we have. We all lie to each other that, that we're doing well. The reality is a lot of us aren't doing well. 10% um, of us feel like I did. Uh, we, we, we suck. We lost some money. 10% uh, or 0 to 3%. So I appreciate the honesty because it's not easy being honest when, when you're not feeling good about your business. 22% uh, is 3 to 6 22% is 6 to 10, and 37 is 10%. Now, I'll tell you the difference between last year and this year is last year we had 20% that we're, that we're making money. So um, this year we're um, let's look at the average here. Well, let's say we're probably about 7 8% is probably where we average out here. Now, that's pretty interesting. So I'm going to flip this over. We have a profitability calculator. This is something I use. Now, I went way into detail when I did this, but... Um, we have this profitability calculator that I had built out. Let me pull this up. And I used this to kind of gauge where my business would be. It's almost like a crystal ball of where we were and what do we need to do to, to get to where we were going. So let's go in here. Anywhere that's orange, you can plug and play your numbers. So in here, we're going to say we were $3 million. That's what you guys averaged out. And we averaged out about 7% uh, net profit. So that's sitting at a 7%, $210,000, which is actually really good, right? Like that's, that's getting into a really good spot. We want to be north of 10. You want your company's net profit to be north of 10, uh, not your gross profit. But your, your net profit is at any time that you're higher than 10, good things happen in your business. When you get below 10, it's really hard and actually... There, there's a saying that if you're less than 10%, you'll never see that money because it doesn't come into fruition where it doesn't hit the bank account. It's always just churning inside your business. Now, when we look at our, our profitability, I don't assume that everyone knows what we're, what, how I look at financials. So I summarize this as that when we look at our polls, we look at that we got $3 million, 7%. Some of you guys are really big and some of you are doing really profitable, which is amazing. I hope you get a little bit more out of this because it's going to generate uh, more advantages for your company. When we look at our profitability analysis, this is how I look at my business. Just if I hate accounting, which I do, uh, I would look at the business this way. You Think of your business as a giant pie and you've got a, a big bucket. The biggest bucket in your business is the cost of goods sold. That is where we pay our trades, we pay our, our laborers. Um, it's anything that we attribute to that cost of goods sold to that job. So all those costs we put in, typically it's somewhere between 50 and 80% of the job is cost. So that's where we're going to focus as an opportunity. Now, the other side of that is that we have this other thing that is the uh, overheads. And inside our overheads, we can have variable or fixed, but I just pump them in together because we're not looking at tuning them. We're just looking to talk about them. So there's these overheads there, your shop, your vehicles, your fuel. Um, they're going to be things that you can't change. It's going to be your, your office expenses. Um, we're talking heat. All of that's going to be in that bucket. It's not related to the job. It's related to running the business. Now, when we look at this, 93% of our average right now, based on this survey, 93% of our cost or of our business is cost. So we only make a small sliver and some of you guys have another cost. Some of you guys are going to have this cost of royalties. The difference between being an independent and having royalties is effectively that that royalty goes to the mothership. The mothership does some marketing for you. They give you some operational training and, and systems. If you're running independent, you're paying it in the market. You're going to get trainers and consultants that work for you. And, and so you're, you kind of have that same cost. It just, it gets there in two different ways. And then the last little bit is profit. And we said seven cents for every dollar is profit. 
seventy dollars for every hundred or for every thousand. That's what we're looking at for profit. So not very much is profit, but a lot is cost. So when we start to look at our business, it's an opportunity to look at costs of where do we save our money, uh, where do we spend. Now here's something interesting. In 2018, the average was seven percent was our net profit. Last year, the average was five percent. Uh, this year, you guys are back up to seven percent. So it looks like we maybe hit this little bit of a pivot, and and pricing's gone up or it's become better. It looks like we're somewhere in that seven percent average. When we look at reducing costs, we look at overheads and the cost of goods sold. That's all of our costs. Ninety-seven percent or ninety-three percent of our costs is here. When you look at it, is you could say, are you making a conscious decision about your costs, or are you just saying that's the cost of doing business? When we got into trouble, I had a partner that got sick, and he was on my my money guy. He was my worry worry. He sit there and look at every penny we spent. Should we buy this drill versus this drill? He was the guy who measured and made conscious decisions about our our expenses. When he passed away, all of a sudden we lost that voice and we started to take our eye off the ball. Now we got into a situation where I, I had the business where we went ten percent, eighteen percent, and then we went minus ten percent. We got sick. We we pivoted. We had a bunch of things happen in our business. A customer changed. We we lost some adjusters that retired. A whole bunch of things happened, and we didn't make conscious decisions of what we were doing. In 2015, I went back and overhauled our business. And I looked at every detail. That's how we came up with some of these uh, these rules, and and it worked really well. When you look at costs, you've got a bunch of buckets inside that that cost. Inside your overheads, you got your plant. You kind of stuck to that. You heat it, you stuck to that. But there's things that you have, staff, trades, materials, overheads, equipment, vehicles, fuel, and then mistakes and chargebacks. And what we look at is where are you putting a lot of time in? So I'm looking for 80% of my results. I'm going to try to put 20% of my effort to 80% of those results. I'm only going to focus on the big things that can move the needle in our business. That's my first set of focus. So how much can you save? And this is where we start looking at the principles of where are dollars going. Now, as, a, as an owner, focusing on spending money sometimes is tough. There's a psychology there that if you like to earn money, I'm a, I'm a go earn first, then I'll let my wife go and figure out the expenses after. Uh, I'm not in the, in the model of saving the dollars first. I would rather go get the charge outs. I'm very focused on the top line revenue driving that. If you have someone that's focused on saving money, or, or a team that's focused on saving money, you're, you're getting the best of both worlds. There's other people that you'll see them and they look like the cheapos. They're always focused on saving money and they're not really focused on charging. They talk about charges as, hey, I'm gonna save money. Uh, it's too much, I can't charge that much because I'm saving money. That's the wrong mentality. And you have to have a balance of both to be effective. When we look at earning a dollar, you save a dollar, you earn a dollar. That's the old saying. And it actually is true here because inside our 90, 3% of our cost, if we can save 1%, we can earn that 1% back to our profit. So let's take a look at where I would spend my time saving money. Now, they're not all the same. Um, what I did is I took out a few things here. Uh, I looked at staff. Uh, saving money on staff wages is not an area I, would, I, I personally save on. And vehicles. Uh, we used to have a, a big focus on our trucks, our fleet, our trailers. And it was like, let's go from this van to this van. And at the end of the day, when we did the balance, the difference was so small that it became a service issue. And I went, vehicles is not the first place I would cut my, my, my savings on. Get the trucks, uh, the trailers, the equipment that you need to run the business. Vehicles are, are such a small cost. They're a big cost to the business, but they're such a small cost because I want the utility of the vehicle, which is more important than maybe the cost. So you're doing a utility versus cost. I don't put them on my uh, my cut list. We make a very good decision on our vehicles, and then that's what we buy. We, we can get vehicles cheaper. It usually sacrifices your service. So what we did is we looked at our trades. And when we get into here and, and we say, well, okay, what's our trade cost controls? We're trying to find 2 to 5% of savings on, on trades. And when we look at that, we go, well, how do you get 2 to 5% savings on trades? when the trade market is tight and maybe in 2024 maybe that changes and, and it becomes a lot looser but what we look at is can i save two percent so can i save two hundred dollars for every ten thousand dollars i pay for trades now there's two ways of doing it 
There's one going back and cutting their bill. Uh, that's how the insurance industry treats us. They negotiate at the front, we do the work, and then they renegotiate at the end. So you're getting your bill cut twice. Uh, usually if you enter into a program, you've taken a haircut, you do the work and you take another haircut. And so your bill keeps coming down and it becomes really tough to do business in that environment. In the real world, when you deal with real trades, they normally don't tolerate that. So you can't do that for very long before that relationship breaks and you lose that, that relationship. But when we look at how do you save money with trades, there's ways that you have to add value to the trade in exchange for a price reduction. So how do we add value to trades? Well, maybe we, we do some scheduling for them, right? Um, we schedule the job, so we get it on their schedule and say, here's the time you have access to. Uh, do you need their materials delivered? There's, there's contractors that will deliver materials to the site. And if the trade doesn't have to worry about the cost of materials, then we also don't give them the profit off of those materials either. They just get profit off their labor. What if we look at how does the trade operate? And I ran uh, in 2011 to 2016, I ran a consulting company for restorers. And one of my res restoration contractors said, hey, can you go work with my sub trades? And I did it because I want to understand how the sub trades thought about the business. Here's what's interesting. Most subs expect to win 50 to 60% of their quotes. So they're looking at, they spend a lot of time. If you look at their average week, it's like Monday to Thursday is work. Fridays and Saturdays is quoting to try to get more work in the future. If you can fill Friday as a work day, well, then now they're making money Monday to Friday, not Monday to Thursday. And if you turn those quotes from 50 to 60% to 90 to 100% of the time they get the job, all of a sudden you're a different partner. So that's one way. That's one way to add value to your your trade. The way we did it, and the way that we showed a, a measurable difference, is we did quick pay discounts. So we came in and we gave our sub trades quick pay. Now at the time, interest rates were like seven eight percent. Um, we but where they are today, we would come in and say, if we gave you a payment in 10, 15 days, would you accept five percent less? And cash flow for them was important, so they would give us a five percent discount on their invoice we would float the difference from the 14 days to 30 or 45, depending on when we got paid. And we would make up some margin there by just cutting their bill. But the value we added was quick pay. If you do that, can you find one, $100 for every 10 grand? Can you find $300 for every 10 grand, $500? We were averaging $500 for every $10,000 of business uh, that we were putting out there. So for us, it was a very good uh, opportunity to make money and we had some cash to do it. When we look at uh, material, I have project managers that were giving away a ton of pricing on material. So we would go and we would negotiate with our materials at the beginning. And what drove me nuts is I'd see our drywaller go to the same uh, business. He was a smaller company. He did less volume than us, but he was getting 15% discount at, at the company. We were getting five. And yet we did three, four, five times the volume that he was doing, and we were somehow getting a lesser discount. What we started to do is to go around and shop our, our buying power to the retailers and said, hey, this is what we spent last year. If we shift some of that spend here, what's the best you can do? And all of a sudden, they were opening up a lot of discounts that weren't published on, on retail. And then the other thing we did is we started to look at how do we increase our, our material margin? So we were able to get five to 10% off of retail pricing just by going and talking to them. Then when we had jobs that were about five grand or more, we would go and have those bid between two or three uh, contra um, uh, suppliers. And the nice thing about materials is they don't complain. The nice thing about material suppliers is they're passing it through. So it's not a service cost. They're just trying to push volume and they can make it up on volume as a sale. So knowing that as a business, we went in and said, okay, we'll negotiate this deal. When we buy materials off the shelf for small jobs, we'll take a deal on it. And then when we get to larger jobs, we're going to have two or three of our suppliers bid. And all of a sudden, those discounts started to come into our business. And it started to make a major difference in how much uh, profit we were generating in our rebuilds. Because we were really focused on, we have a tight margin of rebuild. We have to squeeze points out on, on the cost side and we can't afford to lose quality, so we have to buy the same materials for less. Uh, in a surge event, we would look at our equipment, and our equipment, we would say, okay, how do we save two to 3% on equipment purchases? Do we buy in the middle of a surge when everyone else is buying, or do we plan it out for the year and go, okay, last year we went into a cat, we had this much equipment, 
The shelves were empty a bunch of, uh, let's say, five days. That was five days we could have continued to make money, but we didn't. Now this year, we're going to go and make a purchase. When do we make the purchase? Typically, peak of off season is when you make your purchases. And at the end of the month, when the salesperson has to make a goal, no different than when buying a car, you're trying to get it on the end of the month when they're desperate to hit the revenue targets. And so if you're going to go into a supplier and ask to buy equipment or have them compete on price, off season, end of the month is the best time to go in and do that. Uh, and if you really want to jam it, if it's been really slow for you, end of the quarter, because they're looking at their quarterly numbers. And so if they're short on the quarter, they're going to try to jam some revenue in there. That's when I would be buying my equipment. Now we bought in the middle of cats and it's, it's okay to do that because I'm going to be able to charge it out and get some money back and get some cash back. But at the end of the day, I still overpaid two, three, four, five percent that I could have negotiated in an off season purchase. And if you have it as a capital expenditure, so if you, if you get a little bit more sophisticated in financials, you actually are starting to plan that purchase some point in that 12 months, you can make a strategic CapEx expenditure uh, in those off months, bring the equipment in, and then that way you're set up for it. Now, the other part is, do you lease your equipment? So do you buy your equipment and then run a lease on them? A lot of guys are paying cash for their gear. You can get a four-year, three-year lease to own. All of a sudden, you can triple the, the amount of gear you buy and put it onto a lease, and when you put it onto a lease, the beautiful part is you go from a 10-day uh, ROI down to a three-day uh, ROI for the year. Much easier to afford the business when, you're cap when you have the equipment and it's on a lease and you have the equipment available for three years, that when you hit those peaks, the gear is in your shop and, and you're not scrambling to buy it. That's how we did it. We actually did better than 2 to 3% on our equipment um, because we were actually doing the lease plus shopping it and not doing our cat buys. I, I would say we somewhere got somewhere between five and 10% uh, savings on our gear. Then when we look at it, this is the big one. As your business is growing uh, and as you hire people, mistakes happen, but accountability within the company about scratching walls, pre-existing conditions, um, damaging contents. Is it our staff that are doing it or is there our processes of not documenting the pre-existing conditions? So if you were to look at, I got a, a phone here, cracked screen, right? If I were to have your company come in and deal with this, I could come back if they never took a photo of my phone and say, well, it's got a cracked screen across it. Uh, somebody did that. Um, it wasn't there when, it, when, when we gave it to you and now it's coming back with a cracked screen and you say, well, we don't have a photo of it. Chances are the insurance company's going to put pressure on you to make it go away and you pay. That's what happened to us. On an annual basis, when we started to look at how much did we pay in these mistakes on contents and, and we started to focus on it. We were like, man, we spent $20,000 last year on contents that were damaged because of us. But I've been out on the field with the teams and we're not seeing that we're breaking stuff. And we realized that it was a documentation problem, not a, uh, not an actual breakage problem. The breakage was maybe 0.5. You're going to have some of it. That's just what we do. But the vast majority was the customer just lobbing over complaints. So where do we see that? We see that on legs of, of couches when we're doing the carpet extraction. Uh, if the furniture is in place, you're seeing that the hoses are maybe touching the, the couch. Homeowner sees it and says, hey, uh, that couch never had these scratches before. Meanwhile, it's all banged up from the vacuum cleaner, but they've never looked at it. So documenting pre-existing conditions before you start the job, you can reduce your charge back and your mistakes by uh, anywhere between a half and 2%. And in some cases, if your documentation is really manual, law paper, you can be somewhere near three to four percent of that uh, that cost of writing checks to customers, depending on what type of work you do. Finally, the last one here is overheads. So overheads, I look at as staff, uh, and I said I don't cut back on staff wages. That's not where I look to, to skinny down. It's too competitive a marketplace. It always is hard to find good staff, and especially now. So how do you get more out of your overheads? Uh, I'm looking to see if I can get staff to do 20 to 30% more admin work. And what are some of the things we can do around there? Well, we can add monitors and better technology around our staff so we can drive more efficiency. And I want to drive that capacity in there. Um, something simple, administrators, get them a computer that can run three monitors. If you get three monitors, if you go from one monitor to two monitors, you pick up 50% more efficiency in the administrative capability of working on two monitors. 
When you add the third monitor, you pick up another 20% on top of that. So imagine just a $400 expenditure and maybe $1,000 all in, computer and monitors, and all of a sudden you get 50% increase in, in, in efficiency or, or 60% increase in efficiency in the amount that you can click buttons and move information around. That's a way to scale up your overheads. Uh, the other way on your overheads that you might be looking at is how do you put a, a better team in place? Well, you spend a little money on training so that the people that are there can do more and they have more information. They can make quicker decisions, better decisions, and you can increase your overhead capacity there. What you're doing is effectively, and we'll get to this in volume, is effectively you're growing your business without the growing the expense of your business. So you're growing the capability or the capacity of your business, but you're not incurring more expense, which means your margins grow as you do more volume. And it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting concept because as you grow your business and your margins are growing as you get bigger, that's where you start to see all of a sudden this margin creep or this margin expansion. And you might not realize it when you're running a business, but if you were a million dollar business and you're trying to get to two, you have to spend some money to get there. If you're built for two and a half or, or you're built for two and a, let's say three million, you're going to start to make more money as we go through. And a big part of that is can you get your overheads to do more with the existing expense? So based on this, guys, we're going to go into another poll. What percentage do you think you could save? Uh, by doing any of these little things. Can you can you shop your equipment? Can you go in and, and negotiate on materials a little bit better? Uh, can we document the jobs and prevent some of those chargebacks from coming in? Can we, uh, can we work with our staff to up the skill set of our staff or give them better technology to make them be able to do more with less? Um, all of that is, is where are you seeing that you can increase? Now, you know, can you increase one, two percent? two, three, uh, two to four, four to six, six or more. And what's interesting about that is a lot of times you look at your business and you go, hey, are we, like we're pretty optimized. Every time you think you're optimized, you turn it around and you find out that no, you're probably, you know, you're probably left areas that can pay attention to this year. So last year, if I focused on overheads, this year I might be focused on materials. And then Next year, I might come back to materials and go, wait, you know, market change. I think we actually can go and get a little bit more pressure on our suppliers uh, to see what we can do. Now, here's the results. The uh, 0% said nothing were, were, were optimized. Last year, I think we were at like 5% that said that they could do nothing more. Uh, 21 of you said 1 to 2%. 2 to 4 was 33% of you. 33% said 4 to 6. And 14% said 6 or more. I'll tell you in my experience, my business on costing, uh, somewhere between six and ten is where I was able to to turn the business around, and that's direct bottom line dollars. We went minus ten, we made some changes, we went to zero, we made some additional changes, and we went to plus ten. Uh, so yeah, I I think you've got somewhere between conservatively five and ten percent you can do uh, without much effort. We're gonna move on here. The 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 key here is that when you get a win in one of those columns, right? So let's say you negotiate your equipment, you got a win there. Don't spend major time on minor things. This is a, a saying from Jim Rowan, and I love it because it's, it's, it's where I fall in the trap. I can go deep on something. Don't spend major time on minor things. If you get the major win on equipment, you can still spend time nickel and diming on, on small stuff, but you got the big win. Go focus on the next big win because that's going to deliver a bigger result to your business than trying to really crush one, one silo of your cost bucket. Try to focus on multiple silos and get really intense on, hey, I got a big win here now. Let's go get a big win here. We, we can always come back and recircle to the smaller wins, but you got to focus on the big wins. Now, I'm going to move you over here to the calculator. I want to show you this. So you guys averaged out. I'm going to say three, three. We're about 5% is where we averaged out. Um, so if you came on the bottom here, the way I'm running this is I'm looking at this bottom tab. And in here, when I click on the increased cost savings, I'm going to say it's a 5% increase. And what this says is that your profitability increases from revenue and savings is 71% more. And our $3 million business, this is important, our $3 million business, if we wanted to make that extra 150 grand, we either find 5% of cost savings 
or we grow the business by $2.1 million. Think about that for a minute. The energy to find 5% savings on the things we're already touching and the things that we're already spending money on, or we figure out a way to almost double our business. That's what you're talking about. So what's, where would I spend my major time? If I don't spend major time on minor things, I'd say that the major time we should spend on is focusing on costs because it's a lot easier to get costs than it is to double your revenue, find all the staff, buy all the trucks, or we go save 5%. Pretty interesting, right? Okay, next, the next slide that we're gonna go to, and we're gonna come back here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back here because we're gonna build on this throughout this presentation. So I'm gonna come back here and we're gonna look at the next poll, which is what is the average size of your mitigation jobs? So what is the average size? now? You might not know this, and if, if you don't know it, I, I suggest you should figure it out and keep track of it. Build a spreadsheet, check the, the average size of your job, the number of days you've dried. I like stat sheets like that when, I, when, when we were running the business of what were we doing and how much were we making. Now, the average size is I don't know, and that's fine. Uh, you may not be read, uh, uh, running this metric yet. 2,000 or less, 2 to 5, 5 to 10, uh, or 10,000 or more. And what you're starting to see is that there's opportunities on those $2,000 and less. I see very little coming in at, at, at $2,000 and less. There's a couple of people that and I appreciate the honesty. You're saying, hey, we're not doing really big jobs right now. And that's maybe where your business is. So here's what we got. We got 5% uh, uh, five, five of you said, I don't know. Appreciate the honesty. 3% said $2,000 or less. 47% uh, are between two dollars and $5,000. That's a sweet spot. Uh, then the next ones are 33% uh, are five to 10 and 12% are doing uh, $10,000 or more. So there's a few of you guys that are pushing some bigger jobs and, and that's pretty cool. Now here's the beautiful part. It doesn't matter what you're doing on any of your mitigation jobs. You can find opportunities to make money. Sometimes there's more opportunities for those of you doing the smaller jobs. The next question we have, which is what is the average rebuild uh, uh, size? So what is the average size of your rebuild job? Same question, but these numbers get a little bit bigger. Uh, so I don't know if, if you don't do it, uh, don't answer, but uh, I don't know is a good answer. Uh, five or less, five to 10, 10 to 20 or 20 or more. And Brooke, I might need you to pull uh, uh, the average for me for the uh, mitigation. I need to write it down. So this is good. And so in here, we're getting we're getting some I don't knows, which is good. You're, you're not tracking your average margin. Um, there's an opportunity to win there. Uh, nine of nine percent of you are doing five or less. Uh, Fifteen percent of you, five to ten. This is an interesting number. Ten to twenty thousand dollars is forty two percent of uh, you guys are in that ten to twenty thousand dollar range. Those numbers are are interesting on rebuild when you get to the higher numbers, and we'll get into that. And then 18% of you are 20,000 or more. Uh, so we would say on rebuild, you guys are averaging 10 to 20. And uh, Brooke, could I ask you, can you see the MIT results? Yep, so the majority of the respondents said two to 5,000. Yeah, two to five, perfect. And that's, and that's normal, that's across most of the industry that you're seeing those numbers. So here's something interesting. When we, we talked about earn a dollar, save a dollar, that's one savings. And that, that's when we focus on cost, right? When we talk about the cost in the business, if you can earn a dollar, you save a dollar, you earn a dollar. Um, the, and probably the other way around now that I'm reading it. And then, and then you look at it, if you save a dollar, you earn a dollar. And if you charge a dollar, you earn 10 cents. Well, that's not true because you guys said we only earn seven cents. So when we charge a dollar, we earn seven cents. Here's the interesting thing about our industry and our, our pricing systems is that you can increase your charge outs and there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, and when you earn it, when you charge a dollar and you earn 10 cents or you earn seven cents, it's very true on, on rate and materials, time and material jobs. You're just making the margin you're making and your net profit is gonna be the net profit. Where you start to increase your net profit, is as you pick up that volume. For you guys, it would be this way, right? As you pick up the volume, then you would start to see that, oh, all of a sudden we, we made a little bit more money than, than we did on the other job we did. Um, when you increase your charge outs, this is the interesting thing. If you've got cost of goods sold and you got your gross profit, 
And then you come in here and in the gross profit, you've got your, uh, your overheads that are coming out of the gross profit. So you come in here, you say, you know what, on this job, we had a 55% or 60% uh, cost of goods sold, and we had a gross profit in here. The net profit is carved off once you remove all your overheads. What happens when you go in and you add in some additional charges? Well, if I could find some new charges, I could increase the revenue. I can increase the size of the bucket. I can increase my invoice by just a little bit. And what we found is that in 2023, if most people were making 5%, could you find 4% to almost double your profitability? Now, this is a big concept. And if you look at it, we had a bunch of people. I think we had like 35% of you that were over 10%. 35% of you have found some of those, those lost dollars. The rest of us are still struggling to find those lost dollars, which is okay. That's perfectly fine. So where do we find these dollars? Because in unit pricing, you have an opportunity to charge in rate and material. You add a little bit more to your hourly rate. That goes to the bottom line. And so when we look at our pricing systems and our negotiating contracts, we have to look at this and consider that charge out number, that top line number. Now, when we go into a TPA uh, or we get into an insurance program, that's capped. They, they, they're saying, this is the deal. When you come deal with us, if you want volume, you're going to accept this rate. And now you have to play on the cost factor. When you run in an independent business, it's not there. You can play on the charge out business and you can play on the cost side. Inside those TPA programs, you still have a little bit of room to work on the, on the charge out side because what we see is a lot of estimators leave charges on the table. So let's get into how do you increase that charge out. When we look at increased charge outs, it seems hard, but can you use the standards and regulations to justify your scope of work? Did you capture 100% of your scope of work? I'll tell you, uh, the standard and laws is, is probably the biggest thing that uh, you, you, you're quoting, you're doing the work against, and then you're defending against. A reviewer can't take that away from you uh, unless your contract says that you are not entitled to that charge. Um, spend 10, 15, 20 minutes more of job and capture that scope. We run job to job, and I heard the other day, I was talking to a contractor, I said, man, we're flat out. We barely have time on the job to do the work. So we're just in there throwing equipment, getting the, the, the work done, and then we're off to the next job because we got so much volume coming in. What they're doing is they're sacrificing the charge outs of the job. So on average, you're doing more work, but your margin is dropping. And so you're going to have a lot more costs in the business and you're letting dollars slip through, uh, through your charge out uh, schedule. Are you sizing your jobs? Anytime that we do a sizing exercise, when we do hydro uh, um, webinars, we're undersized as an industry. If you're short on power, you're gonna say, we're, we can't put the equipment that's required in the standard and we need to charge more days. So if they say you're capped at four days, no, we need more days because we have not enough power to put the equipment in. So you're taking a double hit. When we look at our change orders, is there a change that's required? Did the homeowner turn off equipment? Did they change the schedule on you? And so the schedule now changes costs. All of that we have to we have to document and then we have to submit and have a conversation so that we can get paid. We're very bad at doing that. We're very good at running out to companies or to homes and businesses and saving them at a time of need. We're not good at having a conversation of how we get paid to do that. And it's because it's dynamic and it's confrontational at times. A lot of us are just wanting to help people. We don't want to have those talks. We look at the administrative tasks, so uh, burdens to the mind. Uh, staff in the field will forget stuff. Uh, there's reasons that we follow checklists in the field. There's a reason why you follow a task list. It's because you don't want to forget that. They're focused on real work. And so as administrators and owners of a business, we look at how they're functioning in the field. And we're like, man, why can't you just worry about the paperwork? It's because they have to cut the drywall. They're trying to figure out where the extraction equipment is going to go. They're going to set up the dehumidifier how many pieces of equipment we need. There's so many things that they're looking at doing paperwork, which we don't like to do is not a high priority, but we need it because that's what we uh, are getting charged from. Um, do we tell our technicians or our lead technicians or our supervisors how we make money? The big thing that I've seen a lot of companies say, I don't want them to know how much we charge for the job, but they're the people that are literally in a, in a, if you were to look at the model of like a big commercial, we got some of those uh, those guys that said that they were doing 
large profits and large volume. If you don't have the teams in the field that are doing a school, a hospital that understand how you get paid, you're not accounting for that time and money. And so what we see is in more commercial driven businesses, everybody in the stream knows how you make money. In the residential businesses where the training is less, staff turnovers may be a little higher. What we see is that owners or management wants to protect the technician from knowing how the company makes money. That's usually where you start to see margin slip. And that's the difference between the commercial guys and the residential guys. If you look at it just from a business standpoint, everybody in commercial knows how you're making money. Maybe the laborers don't, but everyone that's uh, accounting for the numbers, they know how to make money and that's a difference. I go back to this, standards and laws. When you ever go through a review, now I say the legal process, but I mean the legal process is anything from the time you send your invoice out to it not being paid in full. So you might have to go to a reviewer, you might have to sit with a consultant, uh, you might go to mediation or appraisal, or you might end up going to court and trial and pretrial and all that. If you look at it, what do the standards and laws do for you? Well, if you're an independent juror, like a judge, when they look at the standards and say, the company said that they had to follow OSHA, okay. And the standard for restorers is the IICRC and they were supposed to follow that. Did they? Yes. When the insurance company says, I'm not paying for that, a judge might say, that's unreasonable. And that would defend you. Well, it's also the same if you're in a review. If you said, the standard says this, OSHA says this, and this is what we charged you for, and our contract says this, all of a sudden, it's not your opinion. You're basing it on the uh, uh, on the facts that are given. You're supporting it, and that's a, a legitimate charge that you can put in there. Very hard when you get up higher into the dispute resolutions, if you do your paperwork right, very hard to lose those charges later on. Uh, it becomes much more solid, which is good because if you win those – later disputes then on a regular basis you should be winning the the disputes of hey we want to knock five hundred dollars off your estimate why are they doing that they're trying to knock five hundred dollars off why they're trying to save five percent for their customer because now you are the contractor that they're trying to try to get five five percent savings on so you have to look at can we use osha uh the ir the ria the iicrc nadca are other organizations going to help you do you charge for pp on category ones well, it doesn't say anything in the standard that you should, but in OSHA, it says you should protect your worker against uh, respiratory uh, um, uh, contaminants. Well, is there contaminants being blown in the air on a Category 1? Yes. Can you link the two together for your equipment to be charged? Yes. Are your people actually wearing it? If they do, then you can charge for it. And so it's th that type of mentality of your business is focus on uh, justifying your, your charges. Um, the IRC, I see another one. Uh, stabilizing a job, category two and three jobs. We don't drive. We stabilize, we control the humidity, we clean those jobs. When we get them back to a category one, then we put our air movers in and dry. How many of you charge for stabilization? Very few. Very few people are charging for stabilization. A lot of people are actually putting their companies at risk because they're drying category two and three jobs. So when we start to look at what our knowledge base is and how do we justify revenue, this is one of the things that if you get good at standards, you're, you're educated, right? That's where I talked about investing in your staff. If they have more knowledge, you can defend your estimates. If you can defend your estimates, you can charge more. If you can charge more, it means that you're not going to be in those disputes getting your bills cut. All right, what about proper scoping? There's three methods of scoping your work. Um, top down, which is where you're looking at like ceiling to floor. Hey, we got some shelves that we got to deal with. Outside in, insulation, vapor barrier, drywall, and then orders of operation. We're going to have to set up site protection, do the drywall demo. Then it's Christmas time, so we're going to clean everything up so that the homeowner can go for Christmas. That's different than if we had the, uh, a vacant house. Now we're going to have to set up new site containment and paint the walls. That's two site containments or site protection uh, setups. Well, we're going to have to account for that because the orders of operation dictate that we need to charge for that. Most people go in and do top down and outside in. Very few people think about how the job is executed. Again, what do you need to do that? You need training. You need to understand how the job's going to uh, work. So if you're working on building an estimate out, it's, yeah, it's great. We're going to do drywall, trim, uh, doors. What else are we doing? Are we putting site protection in for drywall? Are we doing dust uh, mitigation with scrubbers? And are we building a negative chamber so we don't put dust throughout the entire system? Are we cutting out the HVAC system? 
Are we blocking it off? Do we need temp heat? All of that comes into building your estimate out, and then it creates a, a scope for how you're going to do the job. Now, we have the, uh, the scoping, like a detailed scope is really important. Um, when you go through a job, and, and, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, uh, part of the deal I said is I'll, I'll leave it for the end, but when you look at scoping, are you capturing all the items uh, that are being done? And if we look at our estimates, for, for those of you that said, hey, we're doing 10 to 20 grand to rebuild, did you capture all the rebuild estimate or is there, is there some money left over? Let's say we're doing 10 grand of rebuild. Can you find $100 of new chargeouts? Could you find $800 of, of chargeouts that you missed? How about two grand? When I reviewed files, I found anywhere between five and 15% left on rebuilds where the project manager didn't put the right, or the estimator didn't put the right numbers in so that the project manager already came into the job under scoped and those costs are double-edged sword. When you fail to scope an item, let me, uh, let me give you an app, uh, example. When you fail to scope an item, like, um, let's, say, let's say replacing baseboard, you, of that baseboard, seven cents is profit. 93 cents is effectively cost, but there's a real cost on there. If you miss, let's say it's a dollar a foot for that baseboard. If you charge it out, you're gonna make seven cents. If you forget it, you're gonna have 50 cents of cost that you have to pay to get that baseboard done. You only make seven cents for every dollar. So now you gotta go find five new dollars to pay for that 50 cents, level six. It's a double-edged sword when you do unit pricing and you miss something. That cost erodes all your profits. So if you ever look on rebuild where it's heavily on cost, your scope has to be super accurate. If you're missing on scope, you're going to miss on profit. When we look at rebuild, the reviewers can't do as much damage to your rebuild scope as you do to yourself. The reality is every time we miss an item, we get the production rate wrong, we get the material cost wrong. It's all eroding your profits. Um, Rebuild, if you need 30% to run your business or 40% to run your business, it doesn't matter what system of estimating you use, you should get to the number that allows you to run your business. It's the pricing tools that are hindering us a little bit in rebuild, but it's getting the scope that's, uh, that's really hurting us. You make money and lose money in the field. So we're, we're demonstrating that here. Where else would you be able to increase your charge outs and get a better scope of work? And if you want to take a picture of this screen, this is the uh, the area that we see a lot of people slip on. Uh, I'll tell you, I paid four grand for windows and blinds because my team left the windows, they left the blinds up. We had a, a, an air mover pointed towards the edge of the counter to dry the underside of the counter. And the blinds baffled against the window for a number of days. I think it was like five or six days. We destroyed the blinds. And we destroyed the window. So we had to replace the blinds for the entire floor. We had to replace the window. Uh, we didn't get charged for the, we didn't charge for the detaching, resetting blinds. You know what you make for that? $35 for about three minutes of work. It's two or three clips and the blinds come off. And we didn't charge for that. So when we didn't charge for that, we didn't make the $100. We added $4,000 to our bottom line expense. And when we looked at it, we went, not only could we have made $100, in that room, we could have made $400 because we had four sets of blinds. We would have had about 15 to 20 minutes of work on there. Our cost on that would have been $10. We would have made 400 and we would have, we would have reduced the liability of, of damaging those blinds. We see that with paintings. We see that with window drapes, window blinds. All of these numbers start to, to come in and, and tally up for you. Uh, covering registers. If you're doing dust contamination, are you covering registers as a $5 charge normally on there? Cleaning the HVAC unit. We used to clean the HVAC unit at the beginning and end of a fire loss. Uh, now we're seeing it sometimes at the end of fire losses. Are you cleaning the glass that comes with it uh, in the final clean? Um, power cords, spider boxes, the extension cords that come with it. There's an extra charge for the extension cord. Uh, fall, uh, floor and wall protection, PP on Cat 3s or Cat 1s. And then if you're doing Cat 2 and 3, do you do an ATP test at the end to verify clean? It's, it's, a, it's an option if you know what you're doing. I see Brooke popped up on the screen, so we've got some questions coming in. Yeah, just a couple of questions here. Um, so back to the section where you were talking about um, reducing costs, you had the slide up that said 
um, trades two to five percent. And can you just clarify, like, what do you consider trades, and what would fall into that category? All right, good question. So, uh, plumbers, uh, HVAC cleaners, carpet cleaners. If you're not doing the carpet cleaning yourself, uh, anyone that I'm hiring, drywall, paint, anyone that's requiring a check for the service. So. If you've come in and you price the job, it depends how you do it. Uh, we won't get into that. But let's say that they said it's a thousand dollars for the service, and you're like, "Cool." If I offer you a, uh, if you do a kickback, now talk, check with your lawyer. In most states or provinces, a kickback of like, "Give me an invoice for X, and then I'll pay Y, and then I'll submit X to the insurance company," is illegal. It's fraud. However, if you offer a quick pay discount, it's a thousand dollars, and if I pay you faster then I can give you a less cost on it. But my invoice is still this. I'm passing on a quick, or I'm doing a quick pay. That quick pay is, I would go to the HVAC company and say, if I pay you in 10 days instead of 45, will you give me 5% off? Or will you give me 3% off? And so we had staggered. We'd had like, I pay you in 10 days, it was five. If I paid you in uh, in 20 days, it was it was like 6% off. Uh, 30 days was three and then 45 it was it was you know we pay the full the full invoice the the faster i would pay the more of a discount i would get which as long as we could cash flow it we were saving money at the end of the year and that's how we would do it um next question so is it possible to charge for the use of an ac or heater for the team to use when it's hot or cold as well to rent it to the homeowner when the HVAC needs to be off and they have no ALE coverage? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. So so you get into uh, what is the OSHA requirement of that, either your, your country or your state. Uh, typically, it's working within a comfortable level. So if you're uh, in an attic and it's 110 degrees, yeah, you're, you could afford to put an HVAC uh, or sort of an air conditioning unit up there because you're trying to cool it to get it so your staff can work in that area for a longer period of time. It's a, it's a heat hazard. So if you do a job risk analysis, you'd say, uh, let's do our job site analysis or a risk assessment. We have a heat concern. How do we mitigate the heat? We have an engineering control. What's our engineering control? AC. And that's how we, we have to uh, mitigate that risk. We don't do a lot of, uh, that's a great question. We don't do a lot of risk assessments in here. I don't see very many in the circle. I don't see many in the industry. If you were to do that category one, do you have a, a dust, uh, um, do you have a respiratory concern? Yes. Dust from the equipment blowing it around is gonna increase uh, the particulate. Can you use a particle counter to check the level before and after you turn on the equipment? Yes. Can you put in equipment that would mitigate that that exposure to staff? Yeah, you have air scrubbers, negative air or air scrubbers, and you have PPE. So that's how you justify it. But just saying it's your opinion is not good enough. But if I have a particle counter, uh, XTech makes a particle counter that you can uh, put in front of, in, into the environment, show that the particle levels are like 5,000 parts uh, uh, going through the particle counter. And then you all of a sudden you put an air scrubber in and 200 did the engineering control work yes is there still a risk yes that's why we're wearing pp this part is you can't have photos of your team not wearing pp but good question uh as, as for the additional heat yeah it becomes a, a a comfort and climate thing uh can your teams work in the cold if it's 30 degrees out can your teams work in that or are you trying to get the environment to dry uh, do you put additional heat in it? And, and we're trying to keep the temperature somewhere between 65 and maybe 80 degrees. So we would put supplemental heat in to get the working conditions so that we can work in the job or we can control the environment, depending on the type of project you're doing. But 100%, I'm looking to OSHA and, and ANSI or the IICRC standards. One of those is going to get you into that normal uh, working condition. Great. Thanks, Chris. Great I'll question. just do one more question for now. That's okay. Um, what are the best ways to train an estimator or do you have any recommendations for additional training? For so I, I like, for an estimator, I like, the tech, um, how do you say, technically uh, focused on technical training. Uh, it's hard for an estimator to come in and you give them a computer system. So there's button clicks. 
You learn how to click buttons in the system. Are you good at your job? Well, if you don't know what, if you don't have a Haswhopper or an HST course, uh, if you don't know what safety should be, how can you charge for safety if you don't know the regulations or rules? Uh, if you're doing uh, a water damage job and they don't have their ASD, WRT, CDS, so you don't have these these designations and this training and the experience, how do you know what you're charging for? Like you, you don't even know what to do on a job, so how can you charge for it? Button clickers as an estimator is okay. You can you can kind of get away with it. Uh, there's a lot of companies, third party companies and stuff. They're just good at clicking buttons and trying to get scope in there. That doesn't mean that that's what the numbers are. So I would say my the basis is technical training through the IICRC. Uh, the best estimators I've seen are typically master restorers with experience that are focused on understanding how the digital systems uh, are built. And so, but the, the basis for a good estimator is usually technical training. And it's what most people miss. Most people are like, let's get them all the button click training. The technical training that relates to the profitability is what's missing in this industry. Good question. And, and you'll have my contact information after if you, if you want to follow up on that one, uh, you can reach out to me. Thanks, bro. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, a few people agreeing with you in the chat. So, yeah, appreciate it. All right, let's uh, let's keep going here. Um, so, when we look at the the like in here, this is the, to your question. This is the technical. If I'm looking at the button clicking, then I'm looking at like what's happening. Like, what could I charge for? But what can you charge for? And what you actually did border lines that that. Are we creating insurance fraud? Did we do with the scope of work? Now, what's interesting is that's a very gray line because when the insurance company says, hey, take stuff off your scope, but you're supposed to do the work, it becomes kind of gray. It's like a, it's a quasi charge system and not really a representation of what we actually do. But when you look at, you know, let's say, let's say power cords and adapters for a spider box. If you have never been on site and you don't know that you're running two extension cords from the main floor to the basement to get power from the uh, stove to the basement, then you probably don't charge for that. Or you're not looking for that from your team and being like, hey, guys, did you really have that much equipment in the basement? I've, I've rarely seen that run without a spider box and extension cords. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah, that was there. And it didn't get listed. So that's where I look for my estimators is, is are we trained? But before that, are my technicians trained that they know that that's what we need to document and do they know what we charge for it? So this is where I say that a whole team has to know how we make money because the team in the field that's putting equipment in should know that that equipment is chargeable and that we're, we're going to bill it out. Um, there's a few different systems. Reach out to me. I'll, it's probably a longer discussion. And if you guys are interested, um, just send me an email and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. All right. Um, Sizing your equipment. This is something that we see almost every time we do a course, we watch companies come in. So when we run in circle hydro training, um, I've seen this for years. If you come in and you use the IICRC standard to size your job, and in a circle on hydro, we do that. It'll give you a recommendation for how many pints is required as your starting point, and then how many air movers you should have as a starting point as well. Let's call it 20 units of equipment is what's recommended. What we typically see is that people walk into a room and they do it by feel, and they're about 50% short. Um, we had a company that called a good company and good people. So, so, so but just it's just how we do it as an industry. They called and said, just before Christmas, we had a loss. And by using your system, we put 30 extra air movers into the job because we sized it right. Now, here's what's interesting. The air movers are part of the standard of care. The dehumidifiers, it's a starting point, and there's different ways to get to a, a dehumidifier count. But air movers are standard of care today. 30 extra air movers. Let's say they average $30 a day. That's $1,000 plus O&P. I mean, you guys don't get O&P in the States. So let's say, let's say it's $900 a day for those air movers. And then you say the job lasted four days. That's almost four grand. That's thirty six hundred dollars in revenue that they picked up because they sized the job right. What else did they do to drive the job faster? What else did they do? They did a better job. 
So that's where you start looking at if you know the standards and you have that technical training. If my estimators, um, in 2009, we had, uh, sorry, 2010, we had a, a manager come in. He was with Toyota. Uh, we didn't get along very well, but he had some really good ideas. He came in and looked at our average days of drying. And his thing was what get, gets measured gets done. And, and it's not his thing, but you, you get what I'm saying. Um, so it came in, we were drying for 12 days. We were paid for, on average for four days. So eight days were free, four days were paid. If we put more equipment in, maybe we would get to six. Six days of drying, four days paid, six days on the job. How do you increase your revenue? Follow the standard, size the job right, get enough equipment on the job. Um, how much equipment do you need to buy? A lot less if you have jobs that are cycling faster, then you don't have all that equipment need because it's not all out. You're drawing jobs faster, so you need less footprint. Um, what else are you doing? Not leaving moldy buildings behind? Not converting water from category one to category three because it sat wet for too long? Whole bunch of great things happen in your business when you size your jobs right. What else are we looking at? You earn profits faster. <laughs> That $1,000 a day was the equipment sitting on the truck anyway. They put it in, they get $900 a day. Sorry. $900 a day, they're getting. That $900 doesn't really have a cost. There's a cost of storage. There's an overhead cost. We already factor that into the business. $900 a day is coming in almost straight to bottom line. Or you could say $900 minus the 30% overhead is $600. $600 is coming into the business every day, pure profit, because we've already paid for the equipment. That's how you earn profits faster. Um, you cycle your, your equipment in and off, and then you identify delayed drawings or the need for more power. The commercial guys will get this. Is you go to a, a school and there's not enough outlets to run the equipment, what are you doing? Either we dry this slow as molasses, or we're going to bring in additional power and we're going to justify generators and we're going to justify spider boxes and we're going to put the equipment that's required to dry this building. If we don't do that, your repair bill is going to be much higher. Technically, it's correct. Justifying it through the IICRC, correct. The result to the insurance carrier is less cost. Do you want to do this versus this? Yes. And sizing your job delivers a better result. It's good for you. And this is the one thing that I say in restoration. You can have this one win, win, win. You can win for the carrier because they can still save money on the rebuild and you can make more money as a company. Our margin is mostly made up in mitigation. So you can have more mitigation that makes you more money. You can save the insurance company more dollars because they have less rebuild and the customer can get back to normal faster if you do your mitigation right in some jobs. That's a good win, and the insurance company should be rewarding us for it. Right now, they're not, or not as a, as a mass movement. There's no mass movement in rewarding mitigation. So that's one of the challenges you might run into is justifying it. And people at the end say, thanks for doing it. Now we don't want to pay you for it. Sometimes you have to justify and, and demonstrate your savings. Change orders. Legal document. This is something that's wild and not done a lot, but... Um, you should have change order on almost all your mitigation jobs. You should have a change order on all your rebuild jobs. When the time changes, hey, Mrs. Jones, we were supposed to be there for, for four days or five days. You turned our dehumidifiers off. I need a change order to say uh, our new timeline is now next week because the equipment was turned off. The price changed. Hey, uh, Mrs. Jones, the air movers and our time, we're going to be here for another five days drying your building because you keep turning our equipment off. Our price is going to change from what we thought it was going to be originally. If I have a change order signed by the homeowner who says, hey, it's too hot here, to your question about adding air conditioning. If it's too hot for them to live with the equipment, you might have to cool the living space down. You have to build a chamber, and then you have to cool it down. And then you, what's your justification? The change is they can't live with that high heat. I watched one company. Uh, I did a site inspection uh, as a consultant, and they – Seniors that were living there were in 87 degree uh, temperatures and they're like, we can't sleep. Yeah. Absolutely, you can't sleep and it's not safe for you. Too hot. Heat exhaustion of the occupant is our primary concern. Get an air conditioner in and justify it or they leave. 
But if they don't have ALE and, and, and leaving is not an option, then you have to cool their, their living space down. 100% justified for air conditioner. Uh, change order, quantity. Do we have quantity changes in our materials? Sometimes. Schedule change, that will, <laughs> that will come up with a, a major change. Material, are we going from one material to another? We quoted this, and now we're doing this. Uh, or in addition to subtraction. So a homeowner says, you know, they did, the insurance company is only paying for one wall. Okay. You want the R3 painted? Yes. Let me get you a change order. It's going to be $400 cash, and, and we'll, we'll do that for you. That's how you use your change orders, because what we normally do now, eh, Mrs. Jones wants the other three walls painted. I can't go to the insurance company and ask them for it because it's a lot of work. I'll just do it for free, and you erode your margin. Instead, give them a change order and say, hey, take this to your adjuster and ask if it's paid for. And if it's not, then you can just pay us that. And if you pay us you know, with a credit card, we'll knock some percentage point off for you. Make it easy. Put an incentive to get them to pay you for the work. Uh, but when you do a change order, it's a document they can send to the insurance company and let the adjuster make the decision. Why don't they do it? Why don't we do it in the industry? They hate the paperwork um, and hate confrontation. That's why most project managers, we interviewed our, our project managers in the past when we had some, we had some project managers who were low margin uh, managers and said, well, how come we have one? We have, we have a manager that's doing 47% uh, gross profit on all work. And we have you doing 18%. Like, like how are we there? Like you're both senior, you're, you're both there. One had no problem saying, hey, I'll play the change order game with you and make sure I get paid. And the other one was like, ah, they don't want to pay it. No one wants to pay it, but you have to give them a reason. You have to show value. And what it is is that most of our teams don't want the confrontation. So it's easier just to throw it into our job and take a cut than it is to go back and say, hey, we need to negotiate. Uh, for you, that's probably a negotiation class is, is how do you become a good negotiator. Some people suck at it. They just don't. They're not even good at it. They'll never be good at it. They don't have the personality to negotiate. Uh, they don't have the position of strength to negotiate. So you need to put someone in with them. We had an assistant that worked with one of our project managers. She was a power negotiator. She loved negotiating and she did a really good job of it. That was her role was to sell upgrades and she loved playing the negotiation game on price. So find the right people. Sometimes you got the wrong personalities. They're really nice people. They're, they never get a customer complaint. Sometimes they never get a customer complaint because they give them too much on the job. All right. Next one uh, here is, uh, <coughs> sorry, guys. After after going through this section, seeing all the stuff that we could do, and there's a lot, and this is overwhelming at times, how much more do you think you could charge per job? Uh, nothing. I already charged too much. Uh, zero to 2%. So could you get $2 for every 100? Could you get 2 to $5 for every 100 you charge out? Uh, five to eight dollars or eight or more. Now, think about this on a thousand dollars. Could you find eighty dollars or on ten thousand dollars? Could you find eight hundred dollars? Could you find two hundred dollars? Five hundred dollars? How much money do we miss? Do we charge for all the time that we did traveling to the site? Do we actually back up our, our, our justification? Um, <coughs> we got one, two, two percent, three percent coming in at. Nothing, I, I charge too much already. You guys are the uh, bohemists that were on the other side of the profitability side. 14% um, of you said zero to two, 41 to two to five. Uh, 18 of you said five to eight and 23 said you could get 8% more. And I'll tell you, I'm in the book with you. I think you can find 8% more without a lot of effort. Uh, we leave a lot on the table. But let's for this exercise, let's say that the majority of you are in that five to 7% range. So we're gonna jump ahead here. And we're gonna to move to the next column down here. Is what if I increase my charge outs? And we said five to seven percent. So let's go in here. Five, five, that's the bit. Yeah, five, we'll say five percent is where you're at. Again, if we did nothing else, if we if we only focused on charge outs and we said screw the cost, well, we run a lean business, you could do the equivalent of running a $2.1 million business uh, additional revenue that you would need. So when we look at this, we've got our total revenue, we got our 7% average net that we're all doing. And then in here, 
if we add 5%, we come up with another $150,000. That's uh, $360,000. Or we have to go and build our business to, to $5.1 million to make the same money if we don't do anything different today. And, or we find $150,000 of charges. Now, here's the thing. Here, here's, here's how I want you to look at it. A three hundred thousand or three three million dollars of, uh, of revenue. Can you find one hundred fifty thousand dollars of additional chargeouts? If you think about it for a minute, that's fifteen thousand dollars on every three hundred thousand dollars. Can you find that? Let's say you had two and a half. That's two hundred fifty thousand dollars a month. Could you find ten grand on two hundred fifty thousand dollars of work? I think you could, pretty easily actually. If you looked at every estimate. And instead of running job to job to job to job to try to pump up volume, you have a team or you have a resource that's looking at, do we charge enough for the job and can we justify and get through the review? That's all you're doing. So in the other focus we were on costs, this focus is strictly, are we able to do it here? The next few, so when we get to the end, I, I, I tell you this is a mind bend and a half for you. Um, but it's something, it's real, and you have to look at it. When we look at volume, and you hear all the big companies telling you, hey, you're going to make it up on volume. Who makes up on volume? Walmart? Ikea? Companies in our, let, let's, let's, I'll put some insurer names out there because they're big, like State Farm, Allstate, Liberty. When they name stadiums, they're huge. They're volume plays in the insurance world. Um, boutique plays might be someone like a Chubb, right? If you had a company like Chubb, they'd be a, a more of a boutique play. But when we look at these companies, Ikea, Walmart, what's the difference between them and you, right? Okay, the big corporates and you're not, you're mom, pa, or maybe you are a corporate. What's the difference? They control the supply chain from the manufacturer to the warehouses, to the stores. They control the marketing, they control the price. They're in control of the entire supply chain. They know if they sell a product here uh, in Wisconsin, it's going to be X. And if they sell it in Florida, it's Y. And they know the cost to get an item to those areas. They can control the entire supply chain. You do not. You are taking volumes. They know when their volumes are coming. They know Christmas time is going to be big. You're guessing when your volumes are going to be uh, coming. We don't know when the weather patterns are going to hit. We kind of know seasonally. But we don't know that this week we can expect that we're going to need more trucks. They do. We don't. Right? So that's a big difference on why they play the volume game and they control the channel. Now, when we look at the insurers, State Farm, uh, Liberty, and, and Chubb, Chubb plays on margin. They charge you for the exact same policy. Everyone sells insurance. Um, you'll see the Chubb policy might cost three, four times the amount that it costs for a different brand. Why? Are they selling you a different coverage? Well, kind of, they're selling you a different quality. You get more when you have a loss than when you do it the other way. And I had this, uh, um, I won't name his name, but he was a, he's a claim executive. And he said, listen, in every insurance market, there's a dumpster. So in, in the, let's call it the premium insurers, there's a dumpster. There's, there's Chubb and then there's another company and another company. And this other company, the third company is where all the brokers put the junk high-end work into and they're the dumpster when you get a claim from them they are fighting against margin and bad claims history so now they are managing their claims really hard the other companies are paying their claims out and you go man it's really hard to do business over here well maybe you should do business over here with a different carrier when we look at volume we look at volume in, in a way that we look at all insurance carriers and all TPAs and all contractor networks the same. You have to change your mindset. These are customers that have different values. Uh, when I was an adjuster, this was, go back 20 years, a long time ago, um, we, had, we had an insurance company that would pay for all the walls. If one wall was damaged, all walls got painted. We had another insurance company that said, no, if one wall is damaged, no walls get painted other than the damaged one. And when you start to look at that, that two different philosophies, you're like, well, they should all do it the same way. They should all paint all the walls. The question is, how much did the customer pay for premium? If they paid $1,000 for one wall, the one wall company, and they paid $3,000 for the all wall company, 
there's a difference in what you should expect for a service. So we don't look at premium, but I would guarantee that when you start to look at your customer base and you're saying, who am I going to take my volume from? Um, it should be from companies that share your values or companies that your business understands how you're going to play the game. They only pay for one wall. Guess what? We give a change order to the homeowner for the other three walls and we don't do the work for free. That's just how you play within the, in the box that you've been given. And then when you go to a different carrier and they say, yeah, we paint all the walls, that's part of your scope of work. So when we look at volume, not all the people you're taking work from are going to give it to you in the same way. We also go, if we have 100 jobs, and, and insurance companies look at law of averages. They say over 10,000 jobs or a $100,000 job, we pay an average of four grand per job. In your business, you're not playing with laws of, of large numbers. You're playing with very small numbers, 100 jobs, 500 jobs, 5,000 jobs. You don't have that same law of big numbers. You have to make money on every file. And you can't say, hey, it'll just work itself out over the big number. It does for them. They don't know your business. It doesn't work for you like that. So we're looking at how do you play the game differently? Uh, one, you pick your dance partners properly. You pick the right type of insurance carrier uh, that will will work to your model. Uh, there's lots of guys that make money in the volume carriers because they built a model where they're like, hey, we can make money in there. We're just not giving the, the other three walls away. Uh, then there's contractors that said, no, I my, my reputation is tied to the quality of the insurance company. So therefore, I'm going to partner with that type of company. But what we found is, if you want a little bit more uh, understanding here, the insurance business is 100 to $500 million of premium. Uh, for those of you that were, were, were coming into the call and said, hey, I'm less than a million, you're maybe zero to $500,000 of sales. They're playing on a big numbers case where they reinsure their losses. So if they make a mistake in their business and they have more losses this year, they buy this thing called reinsurance that says, hey, you collected $500 million in premium. If you have $600, 000, $600 million in losses, we'll reinsure that, that, uh, that, that extra portion. Your business, you don't have that. In your business, you have to add in extra margin to weather those storms. So your businesses aren't even the same. Theirs is a paper business. Yours is a bricks and mortar business. Their business is about running numbers. Your number, your business is about running jobs and making the numbers work. And so when we start to look at underwriting um, and growing your business, for you to go from zero to 500,000, it's a, it's, a, it's a big effort to start a business. To go from 500,000 to 5 million, it's a big effort. For them to go from 100 million to 300 million, it's just a paper exercise, more advertising. And we collect more paper and we write bigger premium. So in their case, yes, they have overhead and underwriting and claims, but it's all about paper. They can grow and scale much faster than you can. When they tell you how to run your business, they're not in the same business as you. I wouldn't take the advice from them um, in the same way that I would from someone that's running a bricks and mortar business. When we look at this um, this business, as you grow from 500K to 3 million, there's a sweet spot there. Once you get past that 500K and you get in that 3 million mark, you start to get into where you get some economies of scale and you get some volume discounts. So they go from 100 million to 500 million. You go from 500,000 to 3 million. That's the equivalent of them tripling and quadrupling their business. Think about that for a minute. Most insurance carriers don't do that. They sort of move up a rank, one or two carriers. But for you in a business, moving up from 500K to 3 million or moving from 10 million to 15 million, there's an interesting uh, activity that happens in there when you start to scale your business. And you have to be care uh, careful of the scaling opportunities. This is what happens, and this is where you can get yourself into trouble. So <coughs> when someone says, scale your business, and at scale, you're going to make a lot of money. You have to realize that running from a million to $2 million business, you can only run so far. And then you have to reinvest and you have to build up that, that revenue uh, to be able to reinvest more. You have to buy trucks, you have to hire staff, you have to train staff, technology, the whole works. In here, remember when I said there was a, a gross profit that you know, you'd be doing work and your gross profit maybe uh, is increasing slightly? The reason why is volume plays into it where before you hit the next growth stages should be the most profitable your business has ever been. Because in here, you should have costs 
that are down. And as you're about to reinvest, you should be making the most amount of money, the most gap here that you're making. And then what happens, and this is how, like this is the big fear this year, and a lot of you guys are saying, hey, we're weathered for it. But a few of you are saying, hey, we're not making a lot of money right now. If you happen to be in the uh, in the scaling piece, if you happen to be growing and your numbers are down, it doesn't mean you're running a bad business. Maybe you're in the growth stage. If your margin drops, you're losing money here. So you might be at a point where you're just about to or you just have expanded your business and now you're actually upside down. You're losing money. And the reason you're losing money is not because of margin, but it's just because your overhead's expanded as you're growing. Maybe it's planned or maybe you didn't plan. Maybe your business dropped in size, and so now all of a sudden you have more overheads than, than your, your growth is. But any time that you're running lower margins and you get into a growth cycle in the business, this is the area that you run your, your business into the highest risk of failing because you're going to run out of, of capital you're going to run your lines of credit out. And if the work happens to go down, right, you, you're growing and you hit a drought, your business folds up. And that's where we lose good restorers to expansion. You're just not ready to expand. You're doing too low margin. You are making money here. You don't make a lot of money here. And, and all of a sudden you fold your business up. <clears throat> when you increase your margins, here's the beautiful part that happens. You make money the whole way through. So you have less money made at the beginning of growth section, but you make a ton of money when you're just about to go to the next expansion block. Restorers that come in here may decide to live in this range and never go to the next block. They may decide that in here, I make so much money that I'm comfortable. And because my business is being, you know, maybe you're paying off a building and stuff. I don't want to scale up to the next size because I'm happy here. And if I happen to scale down, I can make the business work, but I don't want to invest and go through that growth stage again. That's why you see companies sometimes freeze at about the $5 million mark because it's a good spot and there's some risk to get to 10 and there might not be the reward at 10. Maybe you don't have the access to the good volume because this is where volume starts to put a play into it, right? So as we get into the, the bigger numbers, you say, no, I'm actually good being 5 million. I have a good team. We're making good money. So now we paid our staff good wages. We have a high quality business and we're a boutique company. Now you might decide that boutique company is 10 or 15 million, but that's why you'll see if you can increase that margin, then you can choose and, and pick when you grow. And that's what really what uh, a lot of restorers don't understand is that you hit these, these growth stages and that's where it can impact your business. The only way you can be sustainable on a growth path is with maximized profits and understanding that you're taking, we'll call it profits, but it's not really profits. <laughs> Excuse me. It's not really profits. It's you have profitability and then you have money assigned for growth. It all shows up as profits typically to a company, unless you have a, a, a good CFO or a good controller that's, that's saying, Hey, we're going to take 4% to growth. But let's say it's all, it's all, it's all showing up as net profit. If you want to get to that next scaling stage, you're going to reinvest some of that profit into the business. And then that's where if you get caught, you're going to be uh, uh, putting your company up for sale. or You're going to be liquidated by the bank. And we've seen restorers do that. And this year could be a bad year for it. Evidently, it looks like most of you are in a good spot. So maybe last year was the bad year for it. And this year is a much better year. All right. <coughs> How much growth do you anticipate? Sorry, guys. How much growth do you anticipate next year? Uh, downsized by ten percent. <coughs> no growth. Uh, some same volume as today. Twenty-five percent growth, fifty percent growth, or a hundred percent growth. We're shaking and moving, and it's a lot easier to double your business uh, when you're a smaller company. And let's see what we got. We got a few people are saying, "Hey, we're downsizing." Uh, I, that's good. No growth, 25%, both the same as today. 53% uh, of you are saying 25% growth. And 14% uh, of you are saying 50%. Five are saying you're going to double your business. Well, if we look at that, let's put that into our calculator. And here's, here's what's interesting. So now we move over to our bottom and top analysis. If we make these changes that we said we were going to make, we could save 5%, we could charge out 5%. Our 
$3 million business, either we go and double our revenue, right? Or we go find some savings. And if we do that, we build the business to the equivalent in today's business of $7.2 million in, in revenue. Or we have somebody or the team focus on $150,000 of savings and we find $150,000 of new charge outs and you keep the business the same size. Pretty wild. When you look at this, the story becomes this. You, when you break it down, can you find $12,500 a month of savings on a quarter million dollars of revenue? Can you talk to some sub trades and pay them a little quicker and save that $12,500 a month? Can you increase your charges by $12,500 a month? Could you, could you find some equipment missing on water jobs? Could you find PPE that you're not charging for? Can you find that, that heater or that air conditioner that should be on the job but isn't on the job? So another way to look at it is $50 per thousand or $5 per hundred. When you boil it down, can you buy a drill and find it on sale? Can you go from one retailer to another retailer and save 10, 15 bucks on a piece of equipment? It's the small things that you can do that change your business. But here's the, here's the really interesting part, the impact of volume. And I wanna show this with you. Some of you said, hey, we're gonna go down 10%. Here's what's interesting. If you, here's the story. If your business is doing exactly what you're doing today at 3 million, with the changes that we said we could make as a group, we could, we could have the same business, um, the same profit as if we grew it to 7.2 million. Even if your business shrunk by 10%, like to, down to 2.7 million, with the changes you made, you could earn $459,000 in profit, and if you don't make the changes, you would need to sell six and a half million dollars of work to make the same four fifty nine. That's just that's just the story that that what these changes means to you. Your profit next year will be two hundred nineteen percent more, or two hundred forty thousand forty nine thousand dollars more profit by making these changes. That's what we don't look at as restorers. We're out saving people's homes. We're out doing the hard work. As owners, it's hard to go and look inside your own your own walls and try to find these savings. Here's the cool part. Let's grab the 25% uh, growth. And let's see what 25% growth would do to your business if you made these changes. <clears throat> if you grew the business by 25% and you made these changes, you get $637,000 of profitability. If we were to grow our business by 25%, it's the equivalent of growing your business to $9 million. Guys, that's not like, 5% of you said you could double your business. This is almost tripling your business. Think about that for a minute. Like really hard as restorers, we could eat, most of us said, hey, we could either not grow our business or slightly grow our business. In order to get that kind of profitability, you'd have to like really grow your business. Where only 5% of you guys said, that's where we're willing to go. So to me, this seems like your only option to get the equivalent of your business. And, and I hate when we talk about companies and revenue. I did it at the beginning of the call because that's how our industry talks is how much revenue are you doing? I don't give a shit how much revenue you're doing. How much profit are you generating for every dollar that you put out into the environment, right? So if you do a ton of rebuild, your dollars generated might be a lot less, but are you paying for a big shot for water damage? Maybe your, your rebuild division is two people in a desk. What's their overhead? So maybe they're generating a lot of profit for their overhead. There's a whole bunch of ways you can look at this. This is very simple. But when you look at companies that close their doors because they get caught in the middle of a growth stage and then the market turns or the, the, the jobs go away and you hit a drought and you're not set up, you don't own your own work, a TPA kicks you off a list and you're in the middle of a growth stage and you lose a million dollars of volume, that hurts and you feel like a loser. There's some of you guys that are losing money today. It sucks. You feel like you can't get ahead. Look at this. And I'll tell you, just do this. It, it sounds silly. Do this. These are real numbers. This is how it works. In our business, we, we just run to fires. We run to water. We take everything in the door. Even if it puts our company at risk, even if it's bad financially, we do everything. And then we're told by some customers, hey, you need to take those junk jobs so that you can get the good ones. I would be looking to see how many good ones are you getting for that package of junk jobs you're taking 
And are those junk jobs the ones that are costing you all your profit? Because if they are, they're putting your business at risk. And I don't necessarily care about your partnership, but you have staff that you want to take care of, that you're friends with. you got family, your personal family. You're doing all this hard work. You're going away, traveling for, for weeks on a cat, or you're getting up in the middle of the night. Why are you doing that? You're doing that for your family. Well, isn't the purpose of doing it to also generate some wealth for your family and your staff? This is the way you can do it. And then if you have enough capital coming in and you, and you get your ship turned around, if you're losing money, you're, you're going to spend this year trying to get money back. If you're making money, you can make more money and reinvest it into better staff, which makes it easier to run the business. You reinvest in the training. Guys, it's just, I don't know. This is the way you do it to get yourself off the hamster wheel. And most of our restoration companies are on the hamster wheel. And I like to see that we're better this year than last year, but but this is this is painful. When your company is upside down, you're sitting in bed, staring at the ceiling, hoping that the mail has a check for you so you can make payroll tomorrow. It's the worst feeling in the world. Or you're as a project manager, you're looking at the job and you know that you're not profitable. You know that you, 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 everything you seem to be doing is 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 all this effort, but you're not making the money that someone else is. It might be the type of work you're getting. And so if you did the same effort with a different customer, maybe you would get a much bigger result. Maybe that changes your financial position where you're out hustling and getting your own customers and you're focused on that profitability so that the company can survive and thrive. All right, guys, let's go to the, uh, let's wrap this up. So uh, sorry for the soapbox. I just, I hate seeing companies uh, get turned upside down. If we're looking for this, we're looking for that consistency. So consistency drives profitability. What can you do in your business to be consistent? I would say you do, uh, you look at the training. Training is a consistent thing that you have to have. And not just all trainers. By the way, not all trainers in this industry are, are, are built the same way. Technical training is good. I'm a big proponent of it. If, if you can't convert technical training into profitability, there's a problem there. Because, because your business doesn't care about technical training. There's a lot of people who make a lot of money that have no technical skills. So it's not that. It's how do you run your business? Consistently running your business. When it's good, you run the business with the same type of efficiency and scrutinies on costs than when it's bad, right? We don't change and go, oh, now we're profitable. Take our eye off the ball. No, you put your eye back on the ball and you see if there's more profitability. Don't let your numbers uh, trick you either, right? Because you could have, let's say, an eight, like there's 35% of you that at more than 10%. You're like, oh, I'm doing good. Well, could you get to 15%? Can you get to 20%? Can you run, do you have some secret sauce? Are you doing some type of work that is really high margin and you can get more of it? Like don't let some kind of measure of doing good look, make you uh, sit in a comfort zone. Be consistent when you're driving those profits. So here's some some things that I did. In, in 2015, this is what we did. We implemented technology that worked. I, I was an Circle customer before I, I joined Circle. I was an employee number six. I fell in love with what the technology did, and I had moved it into some of my clients. So I wasn't uh, hired to be a spokesperson. I was literally sold on the on on a bunch of the technology that I could do at the day and where I thought we could go with it. Um, I negotiated with some trades, right? So I sent my suppliers and some trade meetings. Uh, I'll tell you one thing I did, and, and I don't share this very often. I did a, uh, a sub-trade um, wine and cheese. I wanted all my sub-trades to see who in the room they were dealing with because I knew if you put me in a room with five restorers and we were all competing, I would be trying to beat them. So I put them all in a room, and then I showed them the amount of volume I give out in a year, and I told them what we expected, and that someone was probably going to lose that revenue this year. So I expected good quality, and I expected them to work with me. That's how we did it is I kind of did like the drywaller meeting and I did a plumber meeting and I did a, an HVAC company meeting and I let them all know that they weren't the only one that came to my, my, my office to get a check and they weren't the only ones that I was looking at. And I put some guys that wanted our work that were calling on us. They got to come to it and they got to see what we want. No different than what we do when a TPA says, hey, do you want to be part of our program? Yeah, I want that volume. Okay, well, then this is what's required of you. Um, I reduced chargebacks with technology. We had a lot of chargebacks for pre-existing conditions. Uh, I, that was my first focus was pre-existing conditions on building and then pre-existing conditions on content. So we, we reduced our chargebacks that way. Uh, digital scoping tools, you know, you've got, we got floor plan. 
hydro and other tools. Yeah, you can look at that. And then we adopted change orders because what we did is we want to prevent those freebies. And I'll tell you, I was shocked at how much we gave away. I was not even shocked. I couldn't believe that we were giving it away. And then we would have meetings talking about how do we increase our profits? And hey, guys, we're going to have a hard time paying bills this month. And then I saw how much we gave away. And I was like, didn't we just have the talk? It didn't translate. It didn't translate that giving away painting walls for free was the reason we couldn't pay our bills. So that was our big thing. And then we, we got into sizing our jobs. We were giving away equipment and we were drawing jobs for like 10, 12, 14 days. I'm like, I sent you guys all to the right courses. And then you didn't convert it into real world application of equipment. What it was is I didn't teach them how we made money and how we could maximize the quality of our service with the revenue that our company needed. In Circle Hydro, you've got that expert in the pocket because right now it's hard to get staff that are trained. Uh, so we helped me make some drying decisions. We got some alerts. Uh, we got an event coming up I'll talk about. But you're basically able to do all of the things that I would do in the field as a water loss specialist. And then you can have a junior technician making better decisions in the field. We have uh, a circle four plan. If you haven't seen this, I can walk a 3,000 square foot uh, home and create a floor plan in less than six minutes, uh, six six to five minutes, and you get to that. And then what we do is we built it with an exact where that we have an ESX that gets created off of that sketch. So you're not spending an hour and a half on site anymore. It used to be how good could you sketch, and everyone was trying to figure out like how to get the best sketch. Now it's you got the sketch and you saved an hour. Spend that hour finding money in your line items. Focus on the estimating items because that's what makes and loses money for you, not do you have a pretty sketch. And then finally, here's what you, you, you've got coming up. Uh, we got show and tell and circle. So if you're not a customer of ours, you can come in for that. The interesting um, one we got on February 8th is that we're going to talk about the alerts in Hydro. These are the alerts that help uh, manage some of the IICRC expectations, uh, things that will improve your job. So it's uh, to the heating question before, because that one's top of my mind right now. Uh, is the chamber too hot? Does it need cooling or is it too cold? Does it need heating? Uh, we have alerts for that in hydro. And so we'll be going through uh, this hydro is not a training for how to do it in the field. This one is for project managers and owners so that you can run your businesses and see what's happening in the field and make better decisions. So that's going to be that webinar. And then there's my contact info. I am on LinkedIn. Uh, I live in LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook, but you add me and I'm not, I don't surf it very much, but LinkedIn is where I spend most of my time. Uh, email me if you guys want to talk shop. We'll set up a call. Um, love talking to restorers about your businesses. And if you are in that unfortunate spot where your business is, is upside down right now, you just need an ear, uh, give me a call. We'll spend 15 minutes and uh, see if we can't point you in the right direction. That's the uh, presentation for today, guys. We're going to stick around for question and answer period. Um, I'm just going to sit here and answer whatever you guys got for as long as it takes. Or tell Brooke tells me that I'm losing my voice and, uh, and, and that's where we end it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, we have a, we have a number of questions here, so I'll kick things off. Um, do you have suggestions on notes on invoices to reference the IICRC or OSHA? so that the adjuster will not fight as much to pay the invoice. Yeah, I, I like those F9 notes. Um, do I have notes on them? Not necessarily. Mine, mine would be outdated and mine are Canadian. So, uh, but here's what I would do. You can grab people's macro notes. I don't like that because here's the problem. If you didn't take the training to know what you're doing, then you can't articulate how to defend it. Just because you put it in a note doesn't mean it's justified. Did your teams do it? Or was it on a work order? Was it part of a field report? So there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole system of creating the scope, sharing it with your teams, having them execute the scope, and then charging it out. Um, what you're seeing now, and I think this is a trend that you're going to see, there's so much third-party estimating going on in the industry of people that weren't on the job site that you're going to see the reviewers on the insurance carrier side challenge you more on was it actually done and why was it done. So if there's an F9 note says, well, this is what OSHA says. Well, okay, then tell me how you and your team uh, applied it. And I'll tell you, it's, it, I can't get into the systems here, but it's, it's effectively uh, a risk assessment, safety first, 
we took a risk assessment. We then executed on it. There's a work order or a field report that says you did it. And then that shows up as an estimating line item. That's the proper Coles Notes way of doing it. And then your justification is your field, your your uh, safety is, uh, assessment is your justification for your estimate. Without that, you're just saying, well, that's what the law says. And then they're going to say, did you do it? Where's the photo of your guy in PPE or where's this photo? Um, I would build my process and my company out to effectively make it easy for the estimator. It's a really good question, by the way. It's a it's a deep question. That's like that's the scratch on the surface. Thanks, Chris. So next question is thoughts on how to bill for pre cleaning and have how to properly charge for a cat two and cat three cleaning. Oh, that's really good. So pre cleaning that one you have to throw some extra context in. Um, if we're talking like corrosion mitigation in a in a fire loss. Um, those are conversations. So, so, so let's talk pre-cleaning. I'll, I'll talk about pre-cleaning in like a fire, like cleaning the duct before you do the structural clean. And if you look at the ducting, it's the justification, but it's a conversation with the adjuster. We're going to clean the ducts to prevent cross contamination. Then we're going to seal them. Once it's clean, we're going to seal the ducts and shut the system off. So we don't cross contaminate the air until we're done cleaning. And then after we're done, we're going to clean the entire building and then clean the HVAC system again. That's, again, without getting into the details, that's sort of the, the flow of the conversation. If you're talking about Category 2 and 3, the new standard, I uh, happen to have it right there, the new standard talks about, and there's a section here, I'll pull it up for you, is 12, 12 something? Because it talks about mitigation, restoration, uh, reme so 12.3, page 60. Remediation procedures for category two and three. Well, two and three are treated the same way. Oh, that's interesting. And then you've got your equipment calculations. And it talks about your, your post-remediation uh, evaluation and verification of two, three jobs. And then it gets into the drawing of a, of a category post-cleaning category one or post-remediation category two, three. So it's all in the standard. I just go through there and then it bases your argument when they say, well, you know, why are you stabilizing for a category two, three? There's humidity control of a contaminated environment. Category two, three, it's a contaminated environment. You have to work your, your argument into, uh, again, into a field process and then it's easy for the estimate. <laughs> They, uh, they actually clarified, they said pre-cleaning on fire and water jobs before demo and drying, if that helps you answer. Yeah, so so there's times when you might apply an antimicrobial or you're doing some pre-cleaning or the homeowner tries some stuff and, you know, we've seen all kinds of weird stuff that homeowners will try and you have to pre-clean that. It, it's, it's more, can you go to the standard? So, yeah, it's... It, Send me an email. If you send me an email, I can I can touch base with you. Here's what I would say. Pull the section from the standard that talks about cleaning and then put in the context of what you did. Is it is it easy to get it paid for? No, because if nine other restorers are doing it wrong and you're the one doing it right, you're you look like the red feather. And you're the odd feather out of the out of the pile of estimates. You're also probably the one that charged more. So now you're also the odd feather out of there. But it's when you can justify it and come back and say, we did this based on this part of the standard. We did this based on this. And here's a field report that says we did it. Here's a, a photo or a video that shows what we were doing. What do you want from us? You're going to lose if you take it any further. And that's, that's where most of us lose is we don't have that. So when they say we're not paying it, you're like, am I in a program? Yes, no. If I'm in a program, I might have to take it because they'll threaten to cut me off. If I'm not in a program, then it's like, can I win? And could I win in small claims court? If I could, then that's the route I would take. Or the business relationship is just too valuable and you're like, I have to eat this one because the adjuster doesn't believe in it. There's there's the business side of it. Uh, but yeah, that's that. the way you're talking would, would make me believe that you already know the standard. You just got to put it in. In regards to equipment, how do you account for the charge price? Is that a standard price? Let's say an air mover is $30, or is there a system slash formula that helps reach a dollar value? 
Yeah, great question. So let's say uh, you've got a a, um, a manometer that measures the negative pressure in the, and there's no line item in, in, in one of the estimating systems that would, would allow you to charge for it. Uh, on small tools, one of the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a hard and fast system, but it's usually a 10, uh, if you look at air movers, air movers on a brand name piece of equipment, not Chinese stuff, but brand name piece of equipment, typically eight to 10 days ROI, right? Return on investment, eight to 10 days. Um, if you had an infrared camera, it was 1500 bucks, is a hundred dollar charge, $150 charge a day for that camera, bad? No, a, a manometer might be $8,000 uh, for, for a normal manometer. Um, if you have one that, that records, maybe it's $1,500. Would $100 a day or $150 a day be unrealistic for that? No. Um, so it's usually somewhere in that, if you look at a piece of equipment within a pricing model and you have something that's not part of that pricing list, then you could say, I can come up with a system that is kind of relevant uh, based on other ways I know to charge. Um, another way of looking at it is like your dehumidifier it might cost you four grand. The charge out might be $150 a day. So maybe it's got a 20 day ROI on it. Um, somewhere in that ballpark between 20 and less on small stuff is not unrealistic. And then, and then it's, can you charge for it? And here's, here's the answer to, to, well, it's not in the list. So can I charge for it? That list isn't comprehensive. There's a bunch of language around, I'm going to say both, but I know for sure it's the uh, one out of Utah. Um, there's a bunch of language around what's included and what's not. And what do you do if it's not in the price list? You make up your own item. If you're on a program, they may say you're not allowed to do that. Your pricing methodology is based on how you price the, the, the items. If it's not there, it's not that it doesn't have a charge. It's that they didn't put it in the list. <clears throat> you make up your own charge and you make up your own list. And this, is a, this is like a, a good discussion on estimating and, and, and owning uh, your price list. A different, different day, different venue. Do you ever see equipment being charged uh, weekly? Are being billed for weekly. Uh, a couple of adjusters and carriers are talking about after three days on a job, it needs to be a weekly charge. Yeah, great question. This stems from uh, what the rental industry sometimes does. So if you go to a rental company, they might have like a four equals seven. Now, granted, they put it on a truck, they drop it off on a site, and they don't do anything with it. So what's the value that was added to that piece of equipment? Uh, meanwhile, you have a technician that was trained. You have a company that stores the equipment, maintains it, keeps it in good working order, uh, has a fleet of it for specifically for their type of work. They're two different business models. Now, if you're going into a unit pricing system, they don't have a weekly rental rate on that. So you want to change the model, which means that we're playing the game however we want to play it, which has been the argument from the restorer side is, I can use the estimating system. It's just an estimating system. It's not a pricing system. When a carrier says we're going to go and pay a rate of X for this, if you're on the program, then you're agreeing to it and don't complain. If you're not on a program, you haven't agreed to it. If that's how your company bills, great. If that's what they want to pay, you as long as your contract says something different, you probably win in small claims court. Check with your lawyer, but there's my disclaimer. But no, you you anyone can say they want anything. It's, it's, it'd be like the equivalent of saying, well, great. I, I want to buy my insurance policy for a thousand dollars, but uh, I've, I've, I've insured with you for six years. So I'm paying 500. And they're like, well, that's not how it works. Yeah, but that's what I want to pay. That's sort of the same model. You want to, you want to put the analogy back on them. It's kind of that, which is, well, that's not how we charge you. Or, you know, we want to put our car insurance on there as well. So, uh, because I pay for the home insurance for 12 months, I only want to pay for car insurance six months. But it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but in their mind, it does because they're playing probably a program. How do you get away from it? There's different ways to bill, but if you're if if you're if you're getting commoditized, we haven't added enough value to our services where they're now like you're just an equipment drop off center. We, and as an industry, we have to figure that out because we have to get away from that. 
So we got a couple of questions about properly sizing a job. So what system do you use um, for how many pieces of equipment are needed on a job site for drying? Yeah, so so there's the plug. We we, we built hydro and I built hydro um, now, Circle's done three versions of this because we were trying to figure out how the how people in the field would actually use it, right? You have a bunch of administrative uh, systems uh, with tactile driven people, people that are using their hands in the field. We use Hydro where we size the chamber. We do it on a drying chamber size. So let's say you have a chamber on the main floor that is a kitchen. That would get sized one way. So depending on square feet and cubic footage, um, category or sorry class of loss and then we have on the basement if we have a wet basement and it had five rooms then we would calculate the air movers by the room and then the dehumidifier by the chamber it's a little administrative if you do it manually if you're doing it with pen and paper but you can do it pen and paper what we do is we try to give you the uh the, the recommendation based on the standard so it says you need x number of pints minimum to start and you need this many air movers in the recommendation between 20 and 25. After you turn all of the equipment on, none of that matters because it all comes down to what are your goals? What's the temperature range you're trying to stay in? What's your relative humidity range you're trying to stay in? And do you have the drying pressure or the drying forces on the job to actually dry the materials? The sizing doesn't matter. Now the insurance companies grab the sizing and said, well, that's how you get paid is just whatever it says you get and it's because they've tried to simplify their side that you see a lot of those rules come in but if you actually follow the standards and if you use try something like a circle but if you follow the standards you'll get to a range and it's not that hard and uh, uh and then see how just do a simple test have your team go set up equipment run on page uh, i think it's page 48 or something on the standard um go run the equipment calculation uh, or use the circle and see where you come in. I can almost guarantee you, you're gonna have more equipment using the calculation than the free ending. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, next question. So in water mitigation, how do you identify a junk job? You take the EMR call, dispatch, sign them up and start work. Who makes that call that it's a junk job? Yeah, this is a great question. So, okay, I hate doing this, but if you used in circle, let's say you go through a cat, uh, a cat inflow where you've got 20 jobs that come in today and you've got a team that can get out to five of them. Are you taking, are you signing up the jobs by driving out to every job or are you using technology? So in, in, in circle, we have link where you can actually triage the job before you send the resource out to it. So, um, in 2016, my team used Circle Link to sign up four municipal uh, properties. We had a town hall, we had a, a police station, we had a library, and we had the pool, and we could have had the convention center and the arena. We left the convention center and arena because the only thing that flooded was the main concrete of the arena. And we put our resources on the other ones. The other ones were worth about $500,000 of work. The arena was worth about ten grand. That's a junk job in the sense that when we got volume coming in, we had a lot of good jobs we could take. Another junk job might be that you've got a bunch of losses that are category one coming in, and you've got a couple that are category three. And if you put your team on the category threes, your equipment for those category ones is not going to be uh, off the shelf. You're going to be working on demoing and setting up jobs, whereas you have other jobs where your equipment rentals can be running into more profitable. You've got customers that are high, you know, you can tell right when you walk in, they're going to be a high uh, babysitting need for you and your team. We take everything, right? Like if we're not experts in mold and there's mold on the job, maybe I want to pass that one up. Uh, if there's a fire job and it's really complex and it's got chemicals that burn, <laughs> we might want to pass that job up and take a fire job that we're, we're, we have the skill set to do. Um, you may have a, a job where you got it from a, a reviewer or sorry, a, a program and they're, they're having you do five inspections on these jobs. You sign these contracts. And so you've got this junk work that comes in, whereas other companies are, are eliminating a lot of that um, busy work that isn't profitable 
And so they're focused on how do I get the five profitable jobs in and filter out five less profitable jobs that I can leave till later. And, um, you know, this massive freeze we just saw in the last two weeks, we have customers that were triaging their work and grabbing really good, really large losses for their, their teams to do. Whereas they were passing on jobs that turned out to be smaller losses or not equipment heavy losses that were more manual labor that they didn't have the resources for. That's a junk job. Whereas if you have a company that has a lot of people sitting at home, that's a good job. But let's grab that one to keep people employed. Uh, so it kind of comes down to your how you're classing it. But sometimes there's jobs that you should pass on that we just don't. And you look at construction companies, they all pass on work that they're like, yeah, just not really feeling that one. We don't. We take everything. And when your business changes to a model where you get a little bit more uh, discerning on what you take, you actually increase your profitability. Great question, though. Really good. Next question. You mentioned about charging customers for change orders that the insurance company won't pay for. Sometimes the insurance company will say that they will pay and then don't. How do you get paid? Yeah, so, so this is why the change order is important. You do a change order up and the insurance company says, yeah, we'll pay for it. Well, you have an email that went to the insured and the insured submitted the change order to the insurer, or maybe you did it on their behalf. So you said, this is a change order, it's $500. I'm not even writing an exact amount, I'm giving you a number. $500 to paint those rooms and they say, yes, go ahead. You have a change order, which becomes a contract with the homeowner because the homeowner signs it. The insurance company approves it. What you're doing is, if you're not using a change order, then what happens is, and I'm not saying you personally, but here's what happens. You send the verbal request or an email out and say it's $500 for the additional payment. They say, sure. You have an email, but you don't have a, a document signed by the homeowner. So you have nothing to hold back to the homeowner. You have somebody's word that they may or may not pay you. If you just switch over to a change order and the homeowner signs, they're responsible for it. And if their insurer said they're going to reimburse them for it, it's not your problem, although it could become your problem, but it's not really your problem. Then, then you're like, hey, Mrs. Homeowner, you owe me the $500. Your adjuster said they were going to pay. And the adjuster says, no, I never said we were going to pay for that. And the homeowner has an email that says they are. It puts the adjuster into conflict with someone that they have a contract with. And then it gets into this uh, an area of estoppel where you believe you have coverage when you don't have coverage. So that you believe it's covered. And I believe it's going to be paid. And so they made a decision off of that, that, that action by the adjuster. It puts the insured in a much better position, puts your customer in a better position in that sense. And then for you, it raises the level of certainty you're going to get paid. The other thing is just collect them from the homeowner and have the insurance company reimburse them. Guaranteed you got your money. If they don't want to cover it later on, that's, that's between them and the insured. Those are two different strategies. It depends if you're playing the program or you're not playing program work is kind of the different approach I take. No program, cash from the homeowner. Program, well, what type of relationship do you have with that program? Again, not all customers are the same, right? Some programs I would trust. Some programs I probably would. And it's no different than adjusters. Some adjusters you can take their word. Some adjusters you can't. Our daytime service call charges an opportunity that we are missing or are they just not accepted? A $200 charge is 6.6% .6 of a $3,000 job. Oh, I like that. You're getting the percentages. Uh, yeah, so so emergency service call out during the day. What are we doing inside our business? Uh, we're now rescheduling resources from other jobs to get to this emergency. It's part of our business. They'll say it's part of your overhead or it's part of your day-to-day. -day. No, it's a charge. When we take on a new piece of business, we charge an extra couple hundred dollars to uh, cover the cost of, of moving resources around and rejuggling schedules. Is, is it part of your general overhead? No, not necessarily. It's, it's, a, it's a cost you're incurring. Uh, what if you had, and, and this is the thing. So on a program, they may say, hey, there's no after hours, or sorry, no regular hour service call outs. Uh, that's part of the concession you give for our work. When you don't have a program, if you would have said, hey, it's $1,000 for us to come look at your jobs, provide you with an estimate, and that's our charge out, why can't it be a $1,000 service charge? I just had a, uh, last year I had a pet uh, exterminator come out to my house and they charged me $350 minimum service call out. 
for a guy who's coming to get rid of mice in a, with a trap, why why is their emergency service call out twice as much as yours? Are they providing a much bigger service or is that part of the hourly cost? Um, it's an interesting conversation, but on, on a smaller estimate, uh, yeah, you could you could absolutely increase your, your margin there uh, and pick up more dollars. Yeah, another area, do you charge for project management time on jobs? In the uh, unit pricing world of, of the, the com uh, computerized estimating systems, they say it's not part of the charge, it's not part of overhead. Are you building it into the price per technician hour <coughs> or is it an additional charge? And so it gets into how do you build your price? Um, do, you, do you show overhead and profit in your price or is it built into your price? Uh, a whole bunch of things when you get in the strategy of pricing uh, that gets kind of interesting. But I, 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 I charged it on any non-preferred contract or, or contract we had. And if we had a preferred contract that didn't state whether we couldn't, we did. Sometimes you had to remove it, but um, you know that was part of the give and take. What pricing software is commonly used other than Exact? So it depends how you play the game. If you're going to be on programs, then you're going to be playing probably in that world. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of systems. There's uh, time and material. There's uh, CoreLogix guy system, which is a different unit pricing system. Uh, you could use that. You can use uh, something completely different, like a construction base and make your own price list. You can make your own price list in Exactware, but now you're playing in the system that they kind of know the rules of. Uh, you can bid jobs. Uh, I personally like rate and material. Um, you can do that with a spreadsheet. Um, you can get creative. There's rate and material, um, sorry, uh, time and materials, which is a, a program that you can buy. I like time and materials from the standpoint that everyone gets charged fair. You get paid for the services that you put on your charge list. They are paying only for what they used. You factored in your profitability into every item on your list. You can adjust it. And <clears throat> when you look at the people that play commercial work, their price list is not dictated to them. So they may have project manager fees that are twice of what a computerized system will give you. That's just what they're charging. And then they're basing it on their ability to sell the customer in the commercial environment. Uh, if you're in residential, could be a little different because it's a it's a different type of space. But again, you can fire an email out and I can, we can have an offline talk. What can you suggest for someone having a difficult time getting and retaining commercial clients? What about ideas for building contents revenue? Sorry, that's kind of two separate questions in one. No, no, it's good. Content revenue is, so So it's good. You're, you're looking at building your business. So commercial is an interesting one. Um, sometimes you have to be like, if you're going after bigger commercial spaces, you know, Coca-Cola's and the big names, you're going to need a big, a big banner to fly with you because they're not looking to do a local deal. They're looking to do a, a regional deal unless you're in a remote location. Then you can kind of sign up the, the the location or the, the the footprint of the building with the, with the building manager or, or the maintenance team. Um, commercial, you know, if you're looking at like residential, multifamily, uh, you're looking at small commercial property managers, great place to go hang out with, get to know them. There are a lot of relationship driven stuff. Sometimes, depending on where you are, not a lot of uh, uh, programs in that commercial space. So it's it's who you know, not, not what programs you get on. Um, Fire departments, it depends on your jurisdiction. We used to have the fire department call us as the trucks were rolling off the off the uh, station and they would call us and say, hey, get ready because we're we're going to a live fire. Can you guys be on site to do fencing and stuff? So we, we had different types of relationships with uh, for commercial work. Um, another one is just being part of the, like, the business chamber of commerce in your town and, and getting to know business owners and doing a lunch and learn at the, uh, at the commerce uh, lunches and it's, it's little things like that. I actually found commercial is the old school way of restoring where you, it's a lot of relationship driven uh, business. Sometimes it's value add in a commercial space being the service company. Like, do you do, do you do upholstery? Do you do their carpet cleaning? Do you do windows for them in the spring? What do you do to, to just be a partner of theirs normally? And then when they have a loss, you're the first call. So uh, it's a little different there. Contents revenue. Contents is, is a unique discipline, but 
there's there's a whole bunch of stuff. We actually have a we have a contents boot camp coming up in March with Barb Jackson. I think it's the Brooke, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's the end of March. Um, yeah, Brooke's kind of half confident. Yes, we have, we're we're yeah, going to have Barb Jackson uh, working with us in March. You'll see this. Make sure you're on for uh, uh, you, you're on for our our, our uh, emails. Uh, when she comes on, I, we will go into depth on contents, and she's awesome. She's got some technical. I'm going to talk a little bit about the business side in that one, um, and we'll get really heavy into contents. If you need more before March, email me. Um, we've had a couple of questions just around if you offer one-on-one -on -one coaching or if you would visit someone's shop to coach their team. If you don't mind just going back to the slide with your contact info and then... So yeah, we can, we can throw that, access to that and then. So I don't have the time to uh, to, to go do the one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Sorry, guys. I thought, I thought I took the slide. off uh, i don't have the time to do the one-on-one -on -one that much um after one of these like and I'll, we'll schedule 15 minutes and then i'll try to point you in the right direction of where i would go to get the the answers and try to figure that out so um you know i got i got time i'm, I'm traveling in the next few weeks but I'll, I'll make time for people that are trying to get their businesses reorganized and i've got a lot of friends in the industry i'll get you pointed to somebody that can help you so yeah if you if that's something you want to do reach out to me uh don't worry about you know being embarrassed where your business is we've all been there so anyone that's, that's crushing it today probably wasn't crushing it at some point in the past thanks chris um so one idea someone shared so they said we started charging three to five percent for the customer using a credit card for payment we were charged twelve thousand dollars last year in fees that we now have charged that to the customer they can either pay the fee or use a check or cash. Yeah, so so it's interesting. Um, I would take a different approach. I would charge an extra three to five percent to the customer. Period. And then if they give you cash, I'd give it as a discount. It, it, it feels like a penalty if you if you charge me three. Um, but if you're like, hey, if you if, if you have to pay with a credit card, it's built into our price already. Uh, if you give us cash, I'll give you a discount. It, it makes them feel like they won. Uh, whereas the way you're doing it makes it feel like there's a you're punishing them for using a source of payment. Just build into your price and give those that want to pay cash a win. And those that don't pay cash, they're paying by credit card. They're just paying your regular prices. It removes one one point of friction there. But I totally get it because you get you get the credit card charge and you're like son of a gun. Build it in as a, it's a cost of doing business. And here's the beautiful part. If you can't accept their credit cards, and that's the preferred way of collecting payment, you've already factored in that three to five percent of it's going to be a credit card charge. So you're not necessarily losing, but if they pay, you know, cash, they can save some money, uh, and you may or may not have to give that three to five percent discount if they pay cash. They might just choose to, you know, that's their method of payment. Do a couple more questions here. Um... So how do you address an adjuster who hires a third-party consultant and expects you as a non-program restorer to abide by their scope and estimate and insist on mediation when challenged? Yeah, so there's, it's depending on the size, um, they can, insist on, uh, sorry, they can in, um, insist on mediation. Depending on your contract, you may choose to go to small claims court. A lot of people are scared of small claims. I love small claims. Um, I threaten anyone that doesn't pay their bills with small claims. Before. Like I show them the applications filled out with their name on it. And then that's the next course of action is we'll file small claims, we'll file liens. Um, you know, but part of your contract, so let me go back. It, it, it part of your contract is part of your, your discussion with the customer. If you're not on programs, then you need to have a really good claim or job intake. You have to have a really good legal process of, of what are the expectations? Are you collecting a deposit from the from the customer as part of your contract? And is there rules around it in your state? You do the work and is there progress payments or not? Right? Again, progress payment. Then they get to the end and it's like, okay, at the end, what's your method of collecting? And so maybe it's a, a letter at 15 days, it's a reminder letter at 21 days, and then it's, hey, we're 
we're going to have to file a lien. And, and, and if we don't get paid, um, they're going to take the next action. Then at, at 40 days, we, we show them the lien letter. And at 60 days, we show them the small claims letter. Like you have to have a process to get through. And part of it is, is you're applying pressure to the customer to force the insurance company because if there's no pressure on them, then this they chose the avenue you're going to fight it, right? They, they're saying you're going to fight in the mediation arena. Well, now you're taking a bunch of costs on and every dollar that, if you look at an invoice, let's say it's a, again, let's say it's 10 grand. What's the mediation worth? Well, they're asking you to take off two grand, 20%. Like, do you have that to take off? Then they say, well, if you don't do that, you're going to go to mediation. So they've already asked you to take money off and then they're not paying you the eight thousand dollars, which is the the undisputed amount. So maybe your contract says something like, uh, "The only way we enter mediation is for you to pay us the undisputed amount first. So then they're not holding your your entire lump sum hostage. Now they're only fighting over two grand. Do they really want to take you to mediation for two grand? When it was ten grand, it made sense, but two grand, maybe it's, maybe we just we aren't going to spend that type of money. Um, there are a whole bunch of ways you can you can get into yeah, it, uh, you gotta be careful. It's not legal advice, but it's it's just as a restorer, it's a business model of how do you defend yourself. Uh, I hate when when you have to go to mediation because you have to pay for that and you have to prep for that, and it's burning resources that both sides shouldn't have to burn. Generally, when you get to those those mediation discussions, you're talking numbers that should have had a, probably a different conversation around, right? Fifty, eighty grand. Rarely do you see it for like five and ten thousand dollars and anyone that does effectively they're they're just using it as a weapon because at five and ten thousand dollars if you're you go to any process for that outside of like a discussion everybody's paying more money than they should so um but it it it's how you build your 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 claim intake or sorry claim your job intake system how do you manage your change orders and then what's the expectation at the end and who's responsible if the homeowner pays you the full check, you never have those conversations, but it's hard to get 50 grand from a homeowner, right? So you have to have those conversations and document it. And some people have a lawyer, like the second that there's a discussion about having a third party reviewer, the lawyers call and you're like, screw it. I build into my price. They want to reduce it. And it's like, Hey, if you pay without a review or you pay without going to mediation, you get 20% discount. It depends what your law says you can do, but it's, it's an interesting concept. There's a, yeah, there, we could talk for hours on, on the strategy of protecting your, your profitability. We have a question from someone in New Orleans. So I'm having issues on receiving payment from clients on all size jobs, residential and commercial. Having a strong contract does not make a difference on getting paid. After paying legal fees and time, is it worth it? Yeah, it, it kind of comes down to like, how, you know, so if it's on all jobs, then I got to go back and look at what's my intake process and what's my documentation process and, and you know, how trained are we? Like, are we making mistakes that others aren't showing up on? Uh, how aggressive are you in, in your in your pricing? That's, that will trigger flags. Um, so that's one of the things that as you try to squeeze more margin and you're not doing it on the cost side, then you start to step, you start to look a little different. So there's, there's limits to what you can do or, or how you do it, but maybe it's the type of work we're dealing with or, or the type of customer we're dealing with. Um, when you see a company that deals with high conflict on many files, typically it's, we haven't had the conversation early enough to set the expectations going forward. So we haven't set the reserve at $20,000. If we've never had that call, their system might say it's five grand. You drop an invoice for 20 grand and they're like, well, we only had it ranked at five. So now there's a problem. And that might be an internal thing for them. Is a second it's outside of scope, it goes up to a review and you're, you're auto triggering these reviews. Whereas if you get into a, and I'm not saying this is what it is, but if you get into a system where you, you're calling the adjuster and giving them a written report saying, hey, we're between 15 and 20 on this job. That's where our bill is going to land. And then when you get to the job, it's like, 16 or 17 or, or 14 that's a little easier because you have some pre-documented conversation uh hard to answer just with a, a small question like that without a, a bigger understanding of the situation have you ever heard of an ia requesting a bid for a tender for the remaining 15 percent of the emergency work 
when we already completed 85% of the work because we were not the preferred contractors for a large fire loss for a restaurant. And the winning yeah. bid was 10% higher than our bid. And, and, and well, yeah, so, so I have heard that um, and we've seen it. And in Canada, it's actually these, the, a lot of the, the mitigation in a fire goes over to a rebuild contractor that may or may not have qualifications. Um, it's been that way for years up here and they don't, they look at fires as different, right? They look at it's like, oh, it's just some cleaning and spray over it with some paint and, and sealers and you call it good. But when you do that, here's the, here's the risk to anyone coming in second. If that handoff isn't really clean, who screwed up the work? The first contractor or the second contractor? Because if there's an odor left, was it something the first contractor did? So if I'm if I'm the first contractor on there and they say they're going to bid it out for the last 15%, I may just say we made our money and we walk away because I don't – or if we it's, we made our money and we walk away, if we get into a legal dispute, as long as we're documented, we, we document that there's still an order of, of fire behind, we didn't finish the job, so we're not held responsible for it, and – you move forward now it opens you up to risk you could be held responsible or someone could say you're responsible but your 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 ability to walk away from the job without liability i think goes dramatically up because you're you're passing the buck that is unfinished um it might be a good spot to be in on the other side if i'm the contractor bidding on it um because they're just trying to create an administrative process for themselves uh, to validate that the, the they're getting the best price if I'm the second contractor involved in that, I'm going to be concerned because who puts the blame on me if the house, if the building had treatments before and then I put chemicals in and it has a counter reaction? How do I dodge that? That's a dirty way of doing it. But when you're not the preferred and someone thinks they're smarter than you, sometimes they open themselves up to liability. It sounds like that adjuster would completely open themselves up to liability when they're just saving that last little bit. I say, let them have it. Um, I wouldn't bid. Me, I would just like take the money that I got and walk away because they're trying to get you off the job and you've got 85% of the job value. Do you want the last 15? You can actually talk to your lawyer, but you could actually walk away with no responsibility on anything that happens on that job going forward because it wasn't finished. That's interesting. I wish somebody would give me that chance. <laughs> Um, how do you get the depreciation funds when the job is completed? Yeah, that's tough. If, if you go into like, you know, you see this on roofing all the time where you got 50% of the roof value and you've got to treat those jobs where there's a depreciated amount. Like you should be asking the adjuster that question early is, hey, is, or is, it, is it actual cash value? They may use the term actual cash value or depreciated amount. And you should be asking the uh the adjuster, hey, is, there, is this, you know, what's the payment arrangements? Are they paying the, just the deductible? Do they have to pay us some additional amounts? Because in some legal jurisdictions, if you didn't tell the customer that their $10,000 roof was going to cost them $4,000, and they were under the belief that the adjuster was paying the whole shot or somehow they weren't going to be responsible for that cash, you may have troubles collecting. You're going to want to set up a payment schedule early, like, hey, you're you're – Estimated value is ten thousand dollars job. You owe us four. Um, I think that a lot of it falls on our shoulders that we we run too fast to help, and we don't run slow enough to do our paperwork and find out who's paying. And those are tough conversations. I don't have the money, um, and I might not have this job because I need to get paid. And we take for granted that everyone's going to pay their bills after they sometimes can't. So it's a business decision. And and I would I would caution you to make sure that the, the numbers are taken care of before you start working. Um, can you provide a few details on where to go and how to lease to own so I can reduce my equipment costs? Email me for that because there's uh, some places in Canada. I got to see if they're if they're still up, and then I don't know. I have to check in the states about where you can go. Um, it's a great solution um, if you can find it. Uh, let me see if I can have something for you. Uh, I haven't done it for a few years, but I know the guys in Canada, and I, I know, I know I might be able to find you the answer. So if you just email me, and if that's something you want, just let me know. Um, I 
All right, a couple more coming in here. Um, how do you explain to homeowners the cost of your invoice? Just using the price list by locating an exact. I always am expected to give heavy discounts to get payment. Yeah, so now here's the question, and, and, and if you can clarify, if you're trying to get the deductible, uh, when their house is wet is a great time to to get your money because everyone wants to pay you when when they're there. When they start to think about the insurance process, and it's normally not us. Normally it's the insurance company that's told them they're not paying for something. They're only going to pay for half the electronics or some some coverage issue that that leads them to be upset. But if you collect that money, that that credit card payment on the first night to collect a deductible. Um, then you got your deductible. If you're trying to get cash after and they're looking for discounts, it's one of these things that if it's a, not an insurance job, do you price in a legal and discount on the end? Do you put 25 points on your invoice when you hand it to them and say, hey, if you pay this in 10 days, I'll give you 20% off. Like, again, if I was selling you a T-shirt and I said, hey, if you buy this shirt, it's, it's a $100 shirt, but if you actually, if you give me cash today, I'll give it to you for 80. Um, I'll give you buy two of them. I'll give them to you for 70 each. Like if I price it in and I know I'm making my money, then I'm good. Part of it is we play the insurance model for the homeowner. And that's, that model is not what you would do for a homeowner. Like regular contractors don't walk in with everything itemized down to the penny of how they're going to charge. And they'll be like, Hey, now I need my money. Oh, and by that overhead and profit percentage, 10 and 10, yeah, that's just something we add in there. It's like, no, why don't you bill me with that blended in and then just give me a uh, $5,000 equipment rental fee and $5,000 labor for the hours we do or something like that. Like, you have to change how you communicate with a homeowner. It's different than an adjuster. <laughs> how can I make the insurance do the payment directly to our company not going to the homeowner and then having the homeowner pay us. So I'm going to defer this to your lawyer, but I will tell you that there's some things you can do. You could in some jurisdictions do an assignment of benefits where you take the spot of the insured and then you can work with the insurance company that way. In some jurisdictions you're allowed to, some jurisdictions you can. Um, in other times your contract with the homeowner can say that they're, you know, you're directing their insurance company to pay you. Again, your lawyer would have to know how the terms are. And sometimes you can't do that. So you may have to get a credit card on file that you can uh, attempt a charge through to show that you requested payment, show they agreed to the payment. It, it comes down to a, probably a lot of work with your lawyer. And I'll tell you, as an industry, we don't spend a lot of time building a strategy for the private homeowner. We build a strategy for the insurance company we don't build strategies for collecting from the private homeowner. If you look at the general contracting industry, there's a lot of systems put in there and, and, and a lot of checks and balances put into that where you don't do the work unless you get cash up front. And then when you, that cash runs out, you get another check. But we don't do that with homeowners here when we drive buildings. We're like, oh no, with seven grand, I'm sure they have the money because they really need the service. And at the end, they're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying it. Tough. I said it's a tough one. Sometimes you gotta walk away, right? If they say I can't pay the bill, but and you're hoping the insurance company's gonna pay, walk away or talk to the adjuster. Spend more time up front. We we rush in, dropping equipment, putting hours into jobs, and we're not sure if we're getting paid because the contract's not signed and it's not very good. I would be very careful on that. And you'll see commercial companies, they limit their risk. They they'll drop equipment. And then they get contract signed. And if they don't, they pull their equipment and walk away. They don't put manpower on most jobs. Most of the commercial restorers are playing with too big of numbers to take too much risk with that. So they're like, yeah, we'll throw some equipment in and stabilize you until we figure out the contract. And if the job turns sour, then you can pay for the increase in the cost. And that's where if you know standards, you can have those conversations with the homeowner is, hey, right now it's category one. If you wait two days, uh, it's going to be a category two or three. And we're going to charge you, uh, you know, double. And that that moves people along the, the payment cycle. <laughs> Do you have 
any advice or experiences um, on finding suppliers for cabinets, flooring, et cetera, who sell direct? In our market, most suppliers go through re retailers where there's huge markups. Yeah, so so we did. We actually went, uh, flooring was different in Canada at the time because we had a, a program um, that ran coast to coast, um, an insurance program. So you, you typically, and we were mostly insurance uh, preferred. In Canada, 90% of our work flows through preferred programs. So it's a little different than you guys in the States. <clears throat> but if you go to cabinet manufacturers, you can get good quality cabinets for a really good price if you can find those not the not the big shops so like you find a custom shop that maybe is a half hour out of town and you can get some deals like we had some deals where we sat down and went through the unit pricing price list and said hey like what would you charge for this type of cabinet and they're like well it's like 150 bucks okay well 150 bucks then we we would have to use this line item to make money and then we basically give the customer, hey, this company has grade A, B, C, and the insurance company is paying for grade B for you. So that's what you get. And so we, you have to play the game. Now, there's a guy, um, uh, Joe, uh, yeah, Joseph, Joseph Cipriano out of Detroit, uh, Concraft. If you, have to, if you want to have a conversation with somebody who I think's figured out the cabinet flooring upselling game, uh, Joe Cipriano call him uh he's in detroit i like the way he looks at his business and he's he's a shaker mover uh trying to find margin in his business and it, i believe it's concraft um out of out of detroit but if you look him up on on uh, linkedin it's joseph cipriano uh, s-i-p-r-a-n-o hopefully i didn't butcher his name but um, and then to tell him I told you to call. So if he gets like 50 calls tomorrow, it's going to be awesome. Just tell him I, I mentioned him and, and he's got an awesome uh, way of looking at his business. Are there any good negotiation classes that you would recommend? I really like Chris Voss. Um, it's a little pricey, but I'll tell you that a lot of the negotiation tactics there work in here. Um, do you never split the difference? No, I, I met Chris and I've talked to him a few times. You, in this business, I'm expecting to lose some dollars sometimes. Uh, where you lose maybe your emotional stability is when you when you think that you're going to get paid every dollar every time. In real business, that's not going to happen. I price the you know price the giveaways into your 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 margin so that you hit the numbers you need to hit. Sometimes you're going to have to discount when you have to discount, but um, Chris Voss's negotiation, there's an online and an in-person and it is really good. And it gets your head wrapped around the fact that you're not splitting everything down the middle, which is what they expect. And so part of his justification is how do you justify getting those dollars and, and paid, getting those dollars paid. I like it. There's, there's other ones out there, but that would be the, the one that probably has the best value. Well, thanks so much, Chris, and thanks everyone for the questions. Just keep an eye on your inbox over the next couple of days, and we'll be sending a copy of the recording, a link to uh, get your ISCRC credits, and the profitability calculator. So that is all coming, but thanks so much for taking a couple hours out of your day to join us, and thank you, Chris, so much for the presentation. Oh, so good. Thanks for the questions, guys. Have a great day and hopefully you have a good year. See you soon.